uh, who's worked hard on a, a number of uh, discussion items uh, and uh, our uh, several attendees. Uh, it's actually an exciting, uh, despite uh, uh, the, the bad news and the pandemic, it's actually uh, a good opportunity uh, to actually have more public included in our board meetings um, and uh, going virtually actually represents a good opportunity for people to attend and watch uh, and participate uh, remotely and live. So uh, thank you everyone for joining tonight. Uh, so with that said, we'll get going with our Pledge of Allegiance. So please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. So the next part of our uh, meeting on May 14th uh, is the Employee of the Month. Uh, so our Employee of the Month this month is Richard Hale. Uh, Richard Hale uh, works at our central garage, which is extremely important for the upkeep of our vehicles. Uh, he is an auto mechanic one, and uh, he was recommended uh, by his supervisor, Ken Booth, who is a maintenance mechanic three. And a couple of, uh, of details that we'd like to mention is that uh, Richard, uh, has performed uh, noteworthy acts and has gone above and beyond the call of duty, um, has an excellent and positive attitude uh, for the village of Southampton uh, and has uh, done an outstanding job supporting and working uh, within a team with his and apartment. Uh, and according to, uh, to Ken Booth, his supervisor, uh, Rich has been a great addition to the mechanic shop. He displays a positive attitude every day and Rich has shown to be a very knowledgeable and talented mechanic who works well uh, above his title every day and he is a very deserving uh, recipient of this award. So uh, thank you, Rich, and congratulations. Uh, and then in addition, I also just wanted to thank every single uh, one of our employees, especially our essential employees uh, who have put um, themselves at risk every single day uh, by doing the job, whether it's our SDPD, our fire department, EMS, uh, our DPW, who has uh, had to uh, deal with uh, the cleanup of PPE and gloves and things like that that they've seen on the floor. So uh, thank you, uh, Rich. Uh, and congratulations and thank you to all of our village employees uh, who have really stepped up during this time. Um, so the next part of our meeting is the public comment. Uh, we're going to see if anyone uh, has a, uh, uh, a hand raise here. Uh, if not, I will turn this over to uh, Russell Crowderville, our village administrator. Uh, and Russell, have we received any uh, written comments? Uh, we did not re <clears throat> receive any um, uh, public comment. We did get some communications, but it was uh, under general communications. Okay. So with that said, um, with, no, uh, with no comments and no hand raises, uh, we can now move to our board presentation uh, from Verizon Wireless regarding the small cell wireless installation. So Julie, you're going to put them on, right? Uh, Mr. Monteleon should be joining in and if we can just unmute yourself. And Mr. Monteleone, if you could please let me know who else is with you on your team tonight that I can add them in. Um, Robert Breyer. Okay. And uh, Kerry Foster, our outside counsel. Okay, they're both joined. And Mr. Breyer, you are muted as is Kerry. So I'm gonna unmute you both. Okay, am I unmuted? You are. Okay, great. Good evening. How are you all? Good. <laughs> um, so is Kerry, you're on? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Um, I guess I'll start off with uh, introductions. Uh, my my name is Robert Breyer. It was mentioned earlier. I'm the senior real estate manager. Uh, for Verizon Wireless, also have responsibility for emergency services as well. Um, I actually had uh, gone to school out on Long Island, out in Stony Brook, and lived and worked out there for a few years as well, but I'm not presently out there. I'm up in Rockland County uh, and have on the phone with us uh, Rob Monteleone, which I know some of you folks know. He's a Suffolk County gentleman who worked with you folks on the leasing and with us also is Kerry Foster. She's our uh, outside counsel and uh, she actually lives out in the town of South Half and herself. Um, they're more welcome to speak for themselves. Um, 
so now I don't know how you guys wanted to work this as far as uh, I know that Kerry had some materials, but I'll start off by just um, thanking you folks for the opportunity to, to be here tonight and uh, present as well as answer any questions that might come up. But uh, for those that may not be aware, if uh, people that are dialing in that maybe we're not members of the board, um, we were, we've been engaged with the uh, Board of Trustees for quite some time to try to figure out means in which that we can bring essential communications um, to the village of Southampton. And uh, what ended up working or looking like a potential option was at the um, Southampton Beach location or Cooper's Beach location. It's, uh, you know, it's not the most ideal in the sense that it's not, you know, a hundred foot tower that's going to provide, you know, vast distances of coverage, but certainly in light of the community that we're in and understanding and being very sensitive to the aesthetic concerns and so forth. Um, you know, we found an application that we think will actually architecturally enhance the the look of the building with the cupola that we're proposing on top of it, as well as provide uh, some coverage in and around the area. Um, in deference to the board, I don't know if you would want us to show some, you want us to show like the, the maps of the coverage areas that we're looking to cover, or did you want us to uh, put on the photo sims, or is there a pr preference of what you'd like to look at? I think the more information, the better. Uh, that would be very helpful. Okay, so um, I guess we could probably start with the coverage. Uh, uh, Kerry, you have the I, coverage map? Yeah, I, I, will, I will pull that up. Okay, so while she's pulling that up, I'll just uh, go into some, uh, you know, generalities on it. So like I mentioned, the site is only approximately uh, 30 feet high. So you are, you do have some limitations when you um, come into certain terrain issues, whether it be very heavy tree lines or, uh, you know, buildings, or you don't have a lot of hills in this particular area. It's pretty flat. So we don't really run into a lot of problems with that. But it's just that, that when you have a site that's fairly low to the ground, as this one is, uh, you know, it is going to impact you, the, the depth of coverage as the signal emanates out toward the horizon and does run into okay. some, even though it's not land topography, as far as hills going, you do run into trees and buildings and things of that nature. So what ends up happening is from the beach itself, you don't have any kinds of obstructions at all on the beach. So you actually get a pretty, very, a very strong signal, like up and down the beach in a much greater distance than you would as you head north uh, from the beach. And so when you go into the easter direction, um, it's not going to be uncommon to have a strong signal for a good mile and a half uh, distance. And then what happens is that, you know, as the signal starts to fade off some, you know, it's, it's not necessarily you might not be, you may be able to make a call, you may not, but as you get further and further away, you're going to end up, you know, getting more and more what they call out of range. When you go into the westerly direction, uh, you also have a pretty good range, not quite as far. Um, so you might be maybe hitting that more at, you know, when you're getting a little past, uh, you know, a mile to mile and a quarter range. Um, I know like if you're looking for like landmarks, like the South, the Southampton Bath and Club, uh, when you go to the east is a, uh, a, fair, a fair landmark. And um, when I go into the other direction, it appeared that, uh, you get past, let's see, where was it? You get closer to road number two, where you, it's like somewhere in the middle between road number one and road number two, that it will start to uh, uh, probably fade a little bit. But again, you don't have any obstructions in those areas. Whereas when you go into the northern direction, you will have, uh, you'll have you know, very, very strong solid signal you know, all the way across uh, what they call Meadowmere Lane and probably up into like the Great Plains Road area. And, you know, around that Great, Great Plains Road area, again, you'll start to see some signal degradation, um, you know, as you get further and further away from the site. Uh, the, the tricky part is just the nature of RF is that 
you could have a, a spot where you have a very, very, uh, a pretty strong signal or at least a fairly reliable signal. And then you could go somewhere that's closer, but you happen to get into an area where you, where you have something that blocks the signal, like a, like a heavy tree line that's very dense, for example, and yet get further away when you're not as blocked by that tree line and then the signal actually gets, you know, a little bit stronger. So um, what we tend to focus on is we design our sites to a certain signal level that what we call reliable communications. Um, and in, in, in those particular areas, you know, we tend to be, you know, a little bit more conservative. So if, we, if you look on the map here, let's see. If you look on the map over here, well, you'll see the green. Um, you, you might see uh, the green only going a little over a mile to the west, but you're going to end up getting into the blue, and you'll get an, a mile, and you know you might be getting more toward a mile and a half. And the same thing when you go in the other direction to the east, you might see that the green is going to take you about a mile and a half, but you could still keep going further along the beach where there's no obstructions, and you're still going to probably be able to make calls without too much troubles over there either. Uh, same thing, it, I forgot for a second, you folks were looking at the map. So if you go to the north, uh, you can see you have very solid green all along uh, Meadow Mirror Lane. And then you have green uh, to the right or to the east a little bit that goes up further north than when you go up straight. And the reason for that is when I looked on the map is you do have a more opening. You have like these, um, I think it was cornfields. You had some open cornfields uh, in a certain area. And then there was another area where uh, it looked like one of the residents had created like a privacy tree line uh, where you'd see some blocked signal where you see the white to the left of uh, where the green is. So uh, that's just to try to give you like an understanding. And, and this is like, you know, like I said, uh, fairly conservative because it's not to suggest that you couldn't make, you know, calls when you get outside the green or even the blue areas. Um, another thing that's, uh, and by all means, stop and interrupt me if you folks have any questions or anything, but an another thing that's critical um, is, is that, you know, in the year 2020, it's not like people really need to be sold on the uh, utilitarian nature of wireless and, you know, everybody uses it for conveniences and there's new, newer and different apps coming out all the time and things that we're using the phone for today, we didn't necessarily you know, foresee just a few years ago, we got kids doing school online now, uh, you know, on their phones and things. So those kinds of things, you know, most of the people are pretty familiar with. But one of the things we do like to um, stress a little bit is also the importance of the access to the 911 network. What happens uh, with respect to that is it's not only yourself just needing and wanting to have that security in your hand should something happen, but what sometimes people lose sight of is also that you you might be in a position where due to something that's taking place, you're not even able to utilize your phone. You could be unconscious, you could be in shock, you could be uh, in a position where uh, there might be a, a criminal activity going on and you're not able to you know speak openly, uh, yet you could have other people that have access to their phones that have access to the 911 network. And, you know, the one thing I told you, I have an emergency services background of many years uh, for our company. Uh, and the one thing that is critically important is that as cell phones proliferated over time and they just got more and more into more and more people's hands, they just became, you know, the eyes and ears for access for our police departments, for our fire departments, for our EMTs and all the first responders. Um, so what happens is now they're estimate approximately a quarter billion calls a year go into the 911 network and of those quarter billion, 80% of them are of the wireless variety coming from, you know, people's handsets that are all over um, the place. And the, uh, the, the part that's so key to that is usually if it's truly an emergency and it, and it comes, let, let's use the medical emergency as an example. Um, you know, usually like time is truly, truly of the essence. So it's usually could be something of uh, blood loss, uh, inability to breathe, some sort of an apparent danger, being in a fire, but you can't escape. So you need access to get somebody to get you out. And those things, the timing element of getting into your first responders is just absolutely critical. And uh, the statistics that what, what 
what or what the, the experts have uh, indicated, it's not my own personal study, but from having done some reading is that they, they estimate that 10,000 lives vary between being um, living and not living on the difference of a one minute difference t differential in time frame of getting into your E911. E so in like last year, for example, in 2019, they feel that they could have saved up to 10,000 more lives if they could have cut one minute off the response times. And, and obviously, you know, a minute might not sound like much, but if you're not breathing or you're, not, or you're bleeding or there's a fire that's creeping up on you, obviously it's a tremendous amount of time. So um, while most of the work here was done by Rob Monteleone, who's an outside site acquisition agent that does work for Verizon Wireless. Well, he did most of uh, all the heavy work and the heavy lifting and, and um, had the long relationship with the board. I was, um, I did get the benefit of getting to um, speak with Kimberly last week, um, as well as a couple other members and their attorney. And, uh, you know, I, I think that what you folks are doing in terms of trying to uh, balance the aesthetic and pristine nature of your beautiful village with the importance of getting wireless there, I, I really think is a, a tremendous coup for your area. Thank you, Robert. Can anyone hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you. I just wanted to welcome all of you and give just a little bit of a, a context. We, unfortunately, some of us didn't see these slides very well, but the slide that you're currently showing is our current cell capability at Cooper's Beach. Is that correct? So what that's showing right now is um, existing wireless coverage relative to our design standards without the site that we're talking about being on air. So, if you want, so if, if you want, I could explain that a little bit further. So yeah. you'll see that, uh, you'll see um, the, the, the blue over to the right. Uh, and that's basically suggesting that we have or, or you see very little specks of green. That's, those little specks of the green are showing where we have a signal level of what we call a neg 85 or better signal, which is what we designed to. Where you have blue, um, you have a, a signal that would be between, wait, wait, hold on one second. I have a, Oh, it says it right there. You just have it covered up. I'll, I'll pull it up oh, on I'm mine. Sorry. Can you see it? No, that's okay. Yeah, so okay. you see the green says that you have a signal level that's greater than neg, neg 80. So neg 80 is actually even better than what we designed for. And the reason for that is because what will happen is that until you start getting to the outer perimeter of the footprint, you're actually in a even better than what we designed for. So if you looked at the previous one and you saw all that green, in that green area, you're actually getting a better signal than what we actually designed for because you're more proximate to the site. But what ends up happening is that, but yeah, you could show that again if you want, absolutely. So all that green area, you're having a signal le level that's at least neg 80 or better, which is even, even a better signal than we even designed for. When you get to the blue area, you're getting to the area that we at least designed for, which is the neg 85. And then when you get beyond that blue area, you're, you're now at a signal level that's, you know, somewhat degraded and not quite at the neg 85 level. So in some of those areas, like I said, you may be able to make a phone call or something, but a typical experience for an end user might be, uh, in addition to either not being able to make a call or a call that's uh, of not proper quality or a drop call, one of the more common things is that in today's day and age where the majority of the traffic that goes over the network is data driven, you wouldn't have speeds that would be necessary for you to complete what, what people would do normally in a day-to-day -day, um, environment today. So an example might be, you know, you're trying to download, uh, you're trying to stream video where you typically need uh, at least three to five meg to have quality, reliable streaming. You wouldn't be able to do that in those white areas. Uh, the other thing that happens is that when you have a lot of traffic on your network, if you say you had some sort of a community event and you had a, a lot of people all in the same area at the same time using your phones, your cell tends to shrink as well as, as, and the same thing happens with your data speeds, they go down. So 
So I, so if you go back to that other map that we were looking at, you'll see that we have uh, greater than uh, the requisite level of coverage that we designed for in just a couple of little spec areas that you see as green and you'll see quality service nonetheless that's that's at the level we do design for in the blue area and then beyond that um, it's kind of a little bit of anybody's guess type of thing um, it's not it's not what we call reliable communications thank you Robert I just want to put it in context which is the our community has come to us uh, whether it be our police department our our lifeguard managers our residents and and surf population and they've indicated that they cannot uh, use their cell phones to report emergencies so for us it, it's primarily a life and you know a health and safety issue so we were looking to you and working with you to bring in this antenna device to enhance that which would allow any carrier of any company, whether it be Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile, to leverage the 911 capability. And I know Chief Cummings is on the call, but some of the challenges that our police have is they have to go down to the beach with two a Verizon and an AT&T phone because they can't always get the information from the distressed, you know, beachgoer or the distressed swimmer that's being identified. So I just wanted to put the context in that the maps that you're showing to us are showing us a before scenario without your antenna, which looks like it's very minimal coverage, if any, to a, you know, a much more um, broad coverage level that even goes a little bit further north into the residential areas and also to the right and left of Cooper's Beach. Is that, I just want to make sure that's what what we're seeing here. Yes, you are correct. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is um, a fairly, like I said, it's a fairly conservative uh, view from the perspective of that all the green and all the blue is 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 accurate based on a propagation modeling tool, uh, you know, and obviously that you're in a, in a dy dynamic environment when you're actually out there on the roads because of, you could have anything from deciduous trees versus when you're not in the growing season and, um, and you have trees that are not deciduous, not evergreens, and then they lose their leaves and that's going to impact propagation. Or you could have uh, weather conditions, heavy snow, you could have uh, things going on. You could have a structure that was built that gets built after the modeling was done and stuff. So this, you know, just to be clear that this is a, a propagation model, they are pretty effective. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, nothing will suffice to replace uh, real world experiences based on dynamic conditions, including traffic on the network. Another thing, uh, since you did mention that uh, you had um, one of your police, uh, I believe it was your police chief that was on the call as well, right? Um, Cummings, yes. Yeah, so the, uh, the other uh, uh, 911 advantage to that is the location-based services. So what will end up happening is you could end up having person that's say trapped in, uh, it could be anything from, you know, some sort of a major weather event that knocked some building down or someone's lost a child that doesn't have any, you, and, and what happens is with the location-based services, you're able to actually locate that person within a uh, certain levels and it basically as time goes on the FCC actually imposes you know more and more stringent requirements so that you can locate them um, with even smaller distance. It's not uncommon that you'd be able to locate somebody within let's say a 50 foot distance uh, um, based on the communication between uh, their, their, their GPS in their phone and the satellites because like after 2005 phones were became equipped with actually their own GPSs versus just the GPSs that are all off of our cell sites. So what will end up happening is depending on how many satellites that that individual phone has visibility to, if they can see three satellites, you'll get it, you'll, have, you'll use what they call triangulation and you'll be able to identify that person into a very, very small area, you know, maybe down as, as low as like a 10 or 10 foot area. Um, and if you only have two satellites, you know, it might be a larger distance, but 
uh, that, that's a big thing also when you're trying to like look for someone that may be in a, like some sort of a, you know, a, a denser forest or some sort of rubble, things of those of that nature. The other thing is that if you're not a Verizon wireless user, um, nowadays, basically phones, as people know, are very much transferable. So you could actually take a phone if you're on one carrier service and you decided to go to another carrier service, you can get that phone activated with them because they use um, uh, very similar uh, uh, frequencies, not the same frequencies, but in the similar range. And so as a result, somebody who would not be a Verizon wireless customer would still be able to use the, utilize the phone uh, to dial 911. The only issue would be that they wouldn't necessarily have their phone identified to the 911 dispatcher on their computer because it wouldn't be registered with us when it makes its way to the PSAP. Um, that's one restriction. Another restriction would be um, if uh, if you were if they were person that, if that was person was trying to speak to anyone else, like say a uh, police chief himself or someone or someone from the police department or first, you know, they wouldn't obviously be able to make a call out to anything other than the 911. But it's still something that definitely has value for that knowing you could hit that button and you don't have to be a customer of ours. Thank you, Mr. Breyer. I think the lion's share of the questions we received is, what coverage capability will this give? What's the aesthetic? And how big is this antenna? And what effect would it have on anyone's health in the near lying areas? We have several residents that live, you know, two, three hundred yards of that concession stand. That and, and I'm opening this up to the rest of the board, but Andrew, you and I in our discussions with a lot of people, and of course, you know, the mayor and fellow trustees and anyone here, uh, those were the areas where people focused. Um, okay, so did you want me to go into the, uh, the health and safety, or did you want me to mention the, uh, did, you want to, did you want to go at the aesthetics and go to the photo simulations? If you could show the photo simulations that you've sent to all of us before that were listed in the newspaper and then just briefly talk about you know, these antennas in general because I, you had indicated they're everywhere and we just need to understand you know, how our community be comfortable. Absolutely, Thank yeah. You. So Kerry, you have the photo simulations up there? I, I'm bringing them up right now. Okay, well, while you bring those up, Mr. Mr. Breyer, is it? Yes. Okay, thank you. Richard Yastrzemski, uh, trustee. Well, I, well, uh, well, I should bring it up. If I just make just a couple of quick things, uh, expound a little bit on what Trustee Allen was just saying. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier in your presentation, uh, this, this um, you have, Verizon has clearly been in conversations with the village of Southampton for some time, uh, several administrations, and different reasons have, have you know, you've, you've hit a wall. Uh, I know the chief can, can elaborate on a couple of scenarios as well of a, a PD um, and, and uh, they vary from uh, health concerns, public pushback, location, size of tower, all, all those things. So uh, which apparently you, you're addressing here, which is good. So just quickly um, for having seen some of these opposition stances in the past, what is or is anything different than what you're presenting here to put on the top of the Cooper's concession stand than what uh, Verizon has presented in the past, and um, you know, you know, what's what, what if anything is different uh, or improved about it or or whatever. And again, I was going to ask what you again you're going to get into about the health issues as well. So if, you know, maybe you can mm -hmm. just kind of wrap that in there. Oh no problem. So so you wanted to know what about the current proposal is different from prior proposals, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. I would certainly defer to Rob Monteleone because I haven't been involved in uh, a lot of the past that got us to today. However, I can tell you this: um, the when you know when we, when you're looking for a cell site and you and especially like I said in an aesthetically sensitive community, um, you're obviously looking for existing structures first and foremost because you want to avoid you know creating a visual impact to the extent that you're able to. By doing that, of course, there are limitations. Like in this case, as I mentioned, you're looking at probably a 30 foot height to the antenna approximately. Um, and then as the far as change- The 30 feet. It's the antenna is being placed- 30 feet at, above ground level. Thank 30 you. Feet, yeah, 30, yes, feet. 30 feet thank above you. ground level, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, no, the antennas are uh, usually a four foot by one foot panel antennas. They're, they're, they're called panel or directional antennas. Um, but uh, as far as what changes is, uh, uh, generally speaking, um, there, are, there are basically sometimes, uh, there are basically some uh, changes like as far as like technology goes that, for example, we use a, a CBRS technology that's just basically another frequency where we uh, have licensing spectrum that, that we may not have had, you know, a couple of years back. So we couldn't have deployed that at the time. Uh, but other than that, um, we are looking at uh, what they call, um, there's four frequencies that we, are, we would be deploying here other than CBRS, you know, 700 and 8, 850 megahertz, as well as 1900 and 2100 megahertz. You folks may have heard that uh, it, the more common term amongst lay people, you might have heard it called AWS or PCS. Uh, the upper bands are called that. Um, the, if, you, uh, if you look at the photo sims here, uh, that's the beach house. That's just actually showing it with the cupola on it. Um, if you can, you can go, you can scroll down, uh, Carrie, to, to another picture. Okay, there we go. And okay, the keep going. What are the Go dimensions on. of the cupola, roughly? The, uh, do you know that, Rob, off the top of your head? I mean, I could look at it in ballpark, but I don't want to guess. I don't. I, I would. I want to say it's, you know, maybe seven feet. Okay. Yeah. I'd have, to, I'd have to look it up on the lease exhibit. I, I think it's a pro. I think it's a, a little over eight feet. Okay. The top, the top of the existing roof of the beach pavilion is uh, twenty-five feet seven inches. And then the top of the cupola will be 34 feet. Exactly, which is why I was saying that the antenna, the, the midpoint of the antenna is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 feet approximately above ground. And uh, in this particular case, they are um, putting in uh, six antennas, two per sector. It's a three sector site. And um, basically, in a, in a, a typical normal uh, cell site, is a three sector site. And that's basically a way in which to obtain uh, 360 degrees of coverage. Um, they also align the uh, antennas in a direction, uh, you know, pointed to try to cover the areas that are most critical to cover. And that they, call, they refer to that as an azimuth. So you wouldn't have a sector, for example, pointing like directly at the beach, but you'd have one going down the beach to the east, uh, uh, or, you know, it would be east, but shaded toward the, uh, toward the beach, you know, in the southern direction, but mostly east, another one west, um, and shaded a little bit also toward the beach, and then another one uh, headed in the northern direction to try to cover, um, you know, some of the businesses and roads and residences that are up in that direction as you move up to the roads that we talked about earlier. So in this picture that you're looking at here, uh, this is showing the uh, cupola that's already, uh, the proposed cupola on the building and what it looks like. Uh, obviously, there is somewhat of a, sub a subjective nature to whether, you know, you like it or you feel it looks good or not. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, architecturally, um, it looks like it actually brings some enhancement to the building. It gives it like a bit of a, a stately appearance. And um, you could look at the building without it, not that you folks aren't already familiar with it, but it's in the picture so you can yeah so that, that's it without it um it just seems to bring a little bit of an architectural presence to it i i i i could be i could be a bit biased but i it's a it, to me it's a truly truly wonderful uh, uh application and i and i've seen many so i, I don't say that lightly um as far as like locations and stuff that we go at, uh, really the, uh, the sky's the limit. We've been on in everything that you could have mentioned. We're on, for example, if, if we talked about hospitals, we're probably on, you know, 40 hospitals in the New York metro area, including like if you're just looking at, you know, ones that are out in, say, eastern Long Island. We're on, uh, we're at Bayshore, we're on Stony Brook, we're on St. Charles Hospital, uh, we're going on Winthrop Hospital uh, probably next year when we get through zoning, and and then like all the big names that you're familiar with, like the the New York Presbyterians and uh, the Montefiores and um, 
Mamamides and Lincoln, and you know, we're 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 on hospitals, and um, in in a lot of cases, we were actually on hospitals very very early on. Like it's not more of a recent phenomenon, and the reason for that is that, um, you know, doctors were amongst the earliest uh, adopters to wireless, and they always wanted it. They were on call, and they had phones, and they usually were people that were tend to be more of the affluent nature. So. You know, doctors had phones early on before they were necessarily as commonplace as they are now. And so they always wanted to have like, you know, quality coverage at the places that they worked and traveled to and from. So we've been on hospitals uh, very regularly. And we also do in-building systems in hospitals, which it means in, in addition to having the antennas on the outside of the hospital to cover the vicinity, uh, they're also in, in, in internal to the hospital to provide um, a more quality level coverage inside the hospital. Uh, Great. Okay, so th this is just another vantage point of uh, of the uh, the building. It shows from different different angles. So again, you, I don't know if you've already went through the before, but this is the after. Yeah, I, that this is the before. And we have a couple questions from our pan uh, guests today. One is just if you have any research on the, uh, I don't know what you would call it, the cell frequencies impact on any animals. I know it's high up, but does it affect, uh, we have a lot of, you know, piping plovers and different animals and come up and down the beach. So do we have, this is a, a question that was just sent to us. Do we have any information on that? So yeah, that, that would actually be handled very, very similar uh, in terms of the you know, health and safety concerns for humans as well. Uh, basically, there are a few different components that you look at when you're trying to evaluate, uh, aside from the fact that, of course, we're, we're, we're bound by FCC compliance guidelines uh, that we are responsible to meet and comply with at this or every other site, whether it's asked for or not, whether we are subject to permitting or not, we're always subject to meeting FCC compliance requirements. Uh, and it's uh, and they're very easy to meet for the simple reason that we're an extremely low power um, technology. And uh, what you look at here is you look at the power levels going out, you look at the frequency. Uh, in, in this case, I mentioned to you the frequencies that we were at, which was the 750, um, uh, 700, 850, 1900, 2100, and 3500. Um, that can get very, very confusing, and I'll just explain to you very, very briefly why. Um, they're considered high frequencies normally, um, which just means that they have uh, shorter ampl amplifications, um, they have shorter uh, sine waves, radio waves, um, versus stuff that's considered in the lower, three, below 300. So things that you might have, you know, people might have heard of typically is like with electricity transmission lines. Those are like in the, let's say in the much lower band in our band, which is much higher. Um, it, it's a, it's a very low power and it's a non ionizing frequency. And you'd look at the power levels um, that we're going at, which are very low power. And you're also looking at uh, the frequency and the most important thing also is something that's called attenuation and I think that's really important for your uh, public to hear about and it basically just says that as you move away from the antenna uh, the further that you go away from the tenant instead of the signal just dropping as naturally one would think instead of doing so linearly it does so exponentially but instead of exponentially it's it's an inverse thing that they call attenuation so what will end up happening is instead of, let's say, linear would be something that might go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Um, when you go logarithmically, it's going to be, it's going to go 5, 10, 20, 40, 80, and so on and so forth. So what ends up happening is when you get very short distances away from the antennas, you already are well below what the permissible exposure limits are. And there really isn't any kind of safety um, concern here at all. The one thing that is, is a requirement is that if there was someone that needed to get up onto the roof and get very, very proximate to the antennas, there's a protocol that's required by the FCC where we actually provide um, a, a protocol to the building owner 
that if he needed to have some maintenance people or anybody that needed to get up on that rooftop to do some sort of maintenance to that, to let us know, we ask for 72 hours in advance, and then we'll find out what they're trying to do, and uh, we'll, we'll determine that if we, if we have to do a shutdown of the site or a shutdown of the sector, if they're going on only one, in, on only one side. But like I could tell you, for example, if you just simply climbed onto the roof with a ladder uh, right at the edge, like say you wanted to clean the uh, gutters out or something like that, you wouldn't even reach like uh, the permissible exposure limits because of the fact that um, the technology is directional and the antennas like go out and transmit toward the horizon. So once you start getting below, you're, you're nowhere as near the permissible exposure limits. Um, I just think it's it's noteworthy to know <laughs> that we're in, we're an extremely low power level type solution. That's why, uh, that's how the name cellular came about many, many years ago. Uh, it's because you're broken down into very small geographic footprints. You're not trying to cover, you know, like a large radio station or television station that may be trying to cover, you know, Northern Jersey, part of Connecticut and New York from the Empire State Building. And you might be going out at hundreds of thousands of watts. You know, we, we're going out here with 40 watt radios, uh, for, you know, when you add them up at 160 watts. So even if the, and they haven't changed like the standards uh, in, in a long, long time in terms of what they call maximal, maximum permissible exposure, but even if they ever did and they ever got more stringent, it's never something that's gonna really impact us very much because uh, we are so low power and so far below the standards. Uh, when we've done what they call uh, rooftop propagation models. It's called uh, RoofMaster. It's a tool that we use to show that we're in compliance with the FCC. And it, at the closest portion of the building where, the, where, the, where uh, they did the measurements and put the calculations in, we were actually below 2% of the actual standard. So we were less than 1 50th of what the maximal, maximum permissible exposure level is. So I know the question was specific to um, animals and the only difference, it, it, it's the same exact application and the same uh, math, the only slight difference is that you're, you, we, we usually, uh, when we do our propagation models, we use like a six foot person to be like, you know, a, a typical human being. A lot of times, um, you know, certain animals are much smaller. So when they look at absorption rates and stuff like that, uh, you know, you might have to change the math a little bit, but the end result is exactly the same because you're not even anywhere remotely close to these limits. All right, could I, could I ask you a question? Uh, my staff would generally be the people working on that roof. So if we do have people up on that roof, can you give a measurement of distance away from the cupola before they get into a danger zone? Like, is that 10 feet or 20 feet or what do you think? Yeah. No, that's an excellent question. Um, so if you notice, if the, you see the way that the, the roof is pitched. So like if you go on top of the roof, like you can't get in front of the antennas. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, you literally have to climb up the pitch and get, in, get you know, very, very proximate to those antennas to do it. But that having been said, you know, just to err on the side of caution, I absolutely would recommend if you guys knew you were going to go up on that roof for any reason, notify us anyway. There's a lockout tag out protocol. Let's say, for example, you were replacing shingles, shingles on the roof and we say, hey, you know what? We don't want this site to be down the whole time they're doing shingles. We'll say, all right, you know what? They're working on the easterly part of the building. We'll shut down that whole sector while they're doing that. Um, it, you know, just to err on the side of caution and be safe and then you know, you coordinate with us and you'll let us know, okay, we're going to do the back of the building now. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll turn that off. And, you know, we can turn it off um, uh, relatively quickly. The only, the, the reason why we ask for 72 hours is one, you know, certainly to make sure that we have all the protocols of the people that we need. And also to the extent that we might be able to augment the network uh, as well, we, we need a little bit of time to do that. But, um, you know, just again, err on the, don't, don't just go up there and do it. Let us know by all means. Okay. Just two questions from our, our listeners. Uh, this, is, is, this is not 5G, is that correct? Someone is asking. Okay, so um, the, uh, you can um, use 5G radios off of 850 frequency. Um, so we can deploy, it's not scheduled to have uh, 5G. Um, I, okay, let me, let me back up for a second. I take that back. So you can, you can deploy 5G. It's not currently designed for as a 5G site, but you can deploy 5G uh, capable radios with the frequencies that we're deploying 
as well as through the CBRS, which is that 3,500 megahertz spectrum that I mentioned earlier. So okay. uh, we that's just the, needed to know if it was coming in as 5G. I think you've answered that. Thank you. Right. The, the, other, the other question is, there are other devices that you had mentioned to us in previous presentations, like gate openers and Bose sound waves. Our understanding was this is similar to that frequency. Can, can you just repeat some of the items that are similar to this frequency that are in our day-to-day -day households? That was another question. Um, well, in, in, terms of the, in terms of the frequencies, uh, they're, not, they're not necessarily, I guess, it's a, uh, I guess that's a matter of relativity of what you'd consider as far as um, you know, close in spectrum. A lot of the household items uh, that you know, I, I think it's important to mention is that a lot of them don't have an RF component. So when you actually do these EME compliance things, you're actually um, you're measuring electromagnetic energy. And a lot of these household appliances that you folks are all very familiar with, such as like a television, a radio, a vacuum cleaner, uh, a hair dryer, all these things, they produce electromagnetic fields, but they're more of a static nature. And the, the, the ones in the household that you're familiar with that would produce an RF component as well would be stuff like a microwave oven, a portable phone, a garage door opener, a baby monitor, those kinds of things. The one thing that they all have in common, so I'm talking about both the static things that are at home that do create electromagnetic fields, as well as the ones that have an RF component to them like our technology does, is the one thing that they all have in common to each other is that they all attenuate very, very rapidly as you move away from them. So for example, you know, if you think of somebody that's using a vacuum cleaner, that may register pretty high and much, much higher than we would ever register on the electromagnetic energy field but you don't usually have somebody that's got their you know, face up against the vacuum cleaner uh, motor. So what will happen is like, they'll take measurements for compliance purposes at three centimeters and then um, at uh, like 12 and 30 centimeters, like that's how quickly stuff attenuates. So that's, you know, just to give you like a comparison of, uh, of like household items that people are familiar with, we, we um, measure extremely low compared to them. Thank you very much. I'm more than happy to take additional questions if anybody has. We can see if there's any additional questions from, uh, from the viewers here. Um, so we'll give them a, a few more uh, moments to, uh, uh, to ask away or to, uh, to raise hands. If not, you know, Carrie, uh, Robert, and Robert, we wanted to thank you for the very detailed uh, presentation as well as uh, all of your input. And um, we wanted to thank you again. It's a challenging time, but we appreciate you being here. Thank well, you. Thank you so much for having us. We, oh, I'm there sorry, Carrie, was, go ahead. was one additional question, if it's okay. Uh, one, uh, one viewer asked, uh, how much revenue will the village generate from this? So, uh, I think, uh, did you want us to answer that? Or are you guys, is that my understanding is that there was a, a lease uh, of, of it's a thousand dollars a month, correct? That, that, that's right. The, the, the goal was not, this is not really an income producer, although, although there is going to be some income from it. The main purpose is the public safety point. Thank you, Brian. We appreciate Thank that. You, Thank you, Counselor. Is there any other questions from the public? If not again, Carrie, Robert, Robert, thank you very much. Thank, uh, you. thank you for being here. Um, we will move forward to our uh, discussion items. Uh, so the first uh, discussion item that we have this evening is one that everyone is, is talking about right now and, and very curious about. And, uh, and that is the um, there was one other question. If uh, let's see if uh, we've got our crew here. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, one additional question is: Are you planning any additional lighting to the area? No, uh, not, that, not that I'm aware of, uh, Monty. There's no lighting being proposed for yeah, this, right? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Thank you. 
And thank you all for having us tonight. We really appreciate you guys uh, letting us uh, come in and answer any of the questions you have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have thank a good you. day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Okay, we'll keep our meeting uh, rolling here. Um, and next up is the discussion item, which is the 2020 beach operations. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I just wanted to mention a few things. Uh, it was definitely um, an honor um, to uh, have been uh, uh, asked by County Executive uh, Steve Ballone uh, to be you know, one of the mayors on his uh, uh, beach task force uh, for the uh, uh, coronavirus. Uh, and um, I wanted to thank uh, Andrew uh, who uh, joined us uh, on our calls uh, with, uh, with the county executive. So thank you, Andrew, for your hard work on this. Um, and so with that said, I'd like to hand this off to, uh, to Trustee Pilaro, um, and he's going to discuss some preliminary uh, steps as what we're going to do to address our beaches uh, and if there's any other discussion items. So uh, Trustee uh, uh, Pilaro, I'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess what, what I'd like to do, it, if I can start, I, I'll, uh, I'll pass it down to Mark, um, who can kind of go over the start of it as, as the uh, commissioner on beaches. And then I'll talk to some certain points if that's, if that's okay. But, uh, but I do appreciate you know, being asked to, to help serve and, and, and work on the beach task force. Um, there's a lot of different things going on out there uh, with regard to the East End and, and the views and everything on beaches. Um, and so I'd love, I'd love for Mark to kind of kick it off just on, on how we're going to start with our, pass, our passes and then, uh, and then we'll come back to uh, specific beaches and, and then to talk a lot about um, Coopers and signage and all of that as well. Um, you know, one thing also that, that I will say is, is that this is kind of phase one um, just through June 30th. This is a, this is a moving target. Uh, this is something that will change. Uh, this, this could change very quickly, both positive, both negative. We're just not sure. So, you know, we want this to be uh, discussions on the board and, and so we can come together with a very cohesive um, plan by, by all of us so that we all agree upon it. Um, because there will be implementation by Gary and his staff as well as by uh, Chief Cummings and his staff. So okay, more. thank you, Mayor Warren. Thank you, uh, Trustee Pilaro and everybody. This was um, a, a very good collaborative effort amongst all the trustees and board members. There was a lot of communication, uh, phone, emails. And, you know, this is an interesting way to go about beaches because no one's ever been through this before. And how do you deal with, you know, a, a virus that now we're coming into our peak season and the, with social distancing and trying to reduce exposures and crowds? You know, how do you do this? So again, uh, as Mayor Warren said, Andrew was on a lot of the calls. Andrew would then feed them to me. And, you know, listening to some of the ideas and, and other townships, we worked really hard to come up with what we felt would work well for our village and our residents and as well as our visitors. So we'll start off with the idea of a phase one, following how the governor has gone with the phases. We felt that to parallel that would be a good, good way to start it. Um, our timing might be a little bit different compared to some other municipalities because we're just getting on this now. I know about a month ago, the mayor brought up the idea of, of starting to limit beach passes, starting to talk about uh, enacting uh, stickers for Coopers, which generally starts June 15th to going earlier. So there's a lot of things that are going to be covered in here that was brought in by everybody's um, ideas. So first, as Andrew said, phase one, we're looking at uh, starting uh, if it goes through tonight, um, going into effect through June 26th, I believe, is because that's when Cooper, Cooper's officially opens. That's when we generally have the people that are in the booths and there's seven days a week of Cooper's um, activity uh, on a full scale. Um, what we are thinking about doing is passes. Beach passes generally, like we said before, uh, are really for Cooper's itself, start about the 15th of June. All the other beach passes start tomorrow on um, May 15th. So any other beach besides Cooper's, you generally need to have passes then. With the way that this uh, corona has affected the way that we normally do business, it's been not the easiest way to go about it with the people getting the self-addressed stamped envelopes, things like that. There has been a big influx lately, but there are still people that are still trying to figure out the best way that works for them to do it. So. 
if we go ahead and do this, we will definitely enact uh, some way for people to extend this through another week to them to get passes. So the actual date, if we do decide that the 22nd of May would be good for Coopers to start bringing those passes as a requirement, there's still a week from today and tomorrow to get that. So let's start with this. Um, we're gonna start passes at Coopers hopefully Friday, um, a week from tomorrow, which will be the 22nd. We would like that last postmark day on a self-addressed stamped envelope to be the 21st. So if you've got it in by the 21st, you are safe to get your passes. There will be probably a drop-off area inside the village hall. We're gonna be working on that so that people can come with a self-addressed stamped envelope, put their information that you can get on our southhamptonvillage.org uh, website that will tell you, you know, what you need and then they will be definitely uh, mailed out that day. The staff in there has done an incredible job of getting things turned around very quickly and efficiently. So um, what we're looking to do is, as for residents, those are the ones that are here, they own, uh, you know, live here all year round and have, uh, you know, property and taxes and things like that. We're looking to start off with three per household. Um, and again, as we said, this is only through phase one through the 26th until reassess. So they will be getting those for no cost, which is what they normally get, and they will be getting three per household. Um, so generally in the past, we've also had fire and school districts, those that live with, with outside the village, they can always purchase them at a reduced fee. And those would be who, if you're in the fire district or the school district. So we're looking to limit those through the 26th to one per household. Um, we know now that it looks like the town is possibly going to be limiting lifeguard service throughout a lot of their beaches. And I believe from what I've heard that uh, Flying Point will be one where they may not have that. So that's going to cause a big influx, I believe. I think the board feels the same way as people coming over to our beaches, which, you know, as uh, our intent is always to look for the residents um, to make sure that we are not going to be overcrowded but it still gives them an opportunity to be able to purchase one per household. Summer rentals, uh, people that come here and spend, you know, a month, two months, three months, uh, we're looking to limit them to one per household. So in other words, what we would do is say, if you were renting a house for the summer, uh, you can get one, but we're looking to have a at least 30 day rental period with a lease. That way we can eliminate short term rentals, and not have too much people coming back and forth because one can go two weeks, one can go a week and all these other things. Uh, that's one of the things that we're, we're gonna be discussing tonight. Um, stop all sales of summer passes. In other words, if someone wanted to come in and just get a summer pass for the price that they would pay, as of now, we're gonna stop all those. So in other words, we're looking at renters, we're looking at residents, and we're looking at town, fire district, school district people to take care of them first. Uh, those are the those are the community members we believe that would be well served to make sure that they have an opportunity on a reduced basis. And finally, the daily beach pass sales. As of, if this goes through, we would not sell any at Cooper's on a daily basis. So again, to reiterate, this is only the phase one portion of what we're looking into that will go through June 26. It could change that day, the 26, it could change the you know, a week from now. We don't know, but we're always waiting on clarification from the state as well as the counties and also following leads of the other municipalities. So there's quite a few things to discuss here. So I'm going to pass a little bit over to Andrew. He's going to get into beaches. Thank you, Mark. Um, with regard to the beaches, we do have seven miles of, of beach um, and we do have access points at, at certain areas where, where people can go down with a valid parking sticker um, and then again, also at, at road D uh, where stickers are, are not needed. Um, but what we are hoping to do is um, we're looking to make another beach resident only um, so that all stickers that would be in those in those in that beach uh, would be for residents. Um, and, and again, it's trying to protect the people and our the people who uh, would are here year round and, and who get to who would want to use the beaches uh, themselves. And so we are suggesting that Little Plains would be a resident only um, for resident only for resident uh, beach permits going forward. Again, 
um, from next Friday, the 22nd through the 26th. Um, so looking for that. We will have um, beaches, we will have signage on all of the beaches about social distancing, um, about what happens when you can't social distance and, and wearing of masks. Um, we are also would like to make a suggestion and you know we need to again um, discuss with the chief and, and all of this to have you know some TCOs potentially at Beachhead on weekends um, so that they could pass along information uh, to the to the people going down to the beach to remind them of social distancing uh, and to remind them to pick up trash and, and, and do all of this. Um, so we thought that would be, you know, at least for a portion of the day, it might be a, a good thing to do. Um, right now, we are in the process of, of potentially uh, redoing the bathrooms at Dune Beach um, so that they can be more compliant and more easily wiped down and more easily cleaned uh, in this situation. Um, so those, again, would probably be closed through phase one um, and then as that beach uh, is normally used a lot more in July and going forward. So hopefully as we come out of phase one or into phase one and a half or two, whichever it is next for us, uh, we could look at having those bathrooms opened and, and e more easily cleaned um, by the village staff. Uh, again, for same reason, we would probably not want to put porta potties down at the beachheads um, for, from a cleanliness and hygiene standpoint, um, because it would be too difficult, uh, too, too difficult for that. Um, again, uh, from signage, we, we plan on having signage as much as possible in as many places um, so that people can easily see it. We will probably have it up on our website as well. We may use some of the sandwich boards um, you know, we may even have a, a loudspeaker at, at Cooper's um, kind of inform people and reminding them of social distancing and, and all of that um, while they're waiting in line to, to come into the parking lot. Uh, there will be uh, procedures that are in place on, on where you park, how you park. Um, and Matt Weeks, our, our manager there, is, 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 you know, really on top of things and has a couple of of uh, game plans set out already. So, so that's been great to see. Um, you know, and, and that does, coming to Cooper's, Cooper's is, is one of our main beaches because it does have the concession, because it does have the lifeguards. And, you know, we understand this. And we wanna make sure again, that um, the residents and, and everyone gets to use Cooper's, but they get to use it safely. And we wanna make sure that we put our our trust in the people that are going down there um, to act properly and to behave themselves when it comes to social distancing. So I think that you know if 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 we can move along those things, especially through phase one, uh, it'll make it a lot easier going into phase two and furthermore for for possibly reopening a, a little bit more of our of the beaches and a little more space. Um, but I don't think you know for the for the protection of our residents, I, I think everyone on this board. Um, would be willing if we are not seeing things go properly um, to you know put a lot more restrictions in place, uh, which is what we really would would hope not to have to do. Um, so at Cooper's, um, some of the things we've talked about with with Matt, some of the things we've talked about about the concession, um, you know that would be for takeout only. Um, that you would need to wear shoes, you would need to wear masks uh, while you're waiting in line. Um, you would need to, again, wear, wear shoes. You would need to, again, wear masks um, going to the bathrooms. Um, we would suggest that we would like to have bathrooms be um, one person at a time, unless you're with a child. There would be no unaccompanied minors below the age of 10. Um, that would be allowed to use the bathrooms by themselves, again, for cleanliness to the next person. Um, we would like to have the bathrooms cleaned uh, every 30 to 60 minutes. Um, and then I know that it's an issue trying to find sanitizers and toilet seat covers and wipes and all of that right now, but we would want to make sure that those are, are there for the people in, that are using the restrooms. Um, so that is, you know, that is very true. One of the things that I know we're also going to do at Cooper's um, under, uh, under the cupola is we're going to be removing all of the picnic tables um, from an eating standpoint. 
again, from, a, a, from cleanly, from hygiene, uh, it just makes it much easier um, to have those removed and, and people will have to then bring, uh, bring the food back um, to where they are sitting on the beach. Um, we will have, you know, our, our, our beach attendants, I know are, are, are for later on in the discussion and coming up in resolution. So we will have them there um, to kind of uh, help uh, a portion. And Matt has, again, Matt has is, is got a way on how to bring people onto the beach and off the beach safely. And some of the, the people in the beach attendants will be helping with those. Uh, we do not plan on rental of our beach chairs and umbrellas uh, in phase one. Uh, Again, it's from a cleanliness and a hygiene standpoint. Um, so that would be best. We believe that is the best utilization of that. Um, and then the last things that I think would be, uh, would be interesting is, is that, you know, putting markers out uh, as, and possibly putting markers every 10 feet on the beach um, that allows for, for safe usage of that space and being able to social distance. And when a group goes, they've, they've got that beach plot, they can spread out a little, um, but they'd really try and stay close to the center of that. And those markers would probably be put out in the mornings and, and pulled up in the evenings. Um, but it would be a way that, that uh, again, uh, people could understand where, where they should be sitting and, and all of that. Um, so those are our recommendations um, on the beaches. And then we do have some discussion points um, that I think you know, merits further discussion with regards uh, to the entire board. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Egan. He is, I see his finger raised. Yep, thank you, Trustee Pilaro and Trustee Parrish and the entire board, because I knew it was a very collaborative effort to get this done. But uh, certainly uh, Trustee Parrish and Trustee Pilaro uh, did quite a bit of work on this. Um, before we move to any discussion points, which might be um, uh, something for implementation later in phase one and potentially even in phase two, I might just call and I'll, I'll, I'll rely on the mayor as the chair, whether he wants to consider possibly a resolution adopting the um, beach proposals as um, presented. The only thing, the only thing I'd like to add um, is that I think it was assumed, but it wasn't specifically said that I know we won't be doing daily passes, but we also highly recommend that there'll be no sales at all at the beaches because the only passes that we do sell at the beach are dailies, non-resident, and summer visitor. And since the restrictions on the non-resident and the summer visitor are going to be um, changed, uh, it, it'd be very difficult for them to make those sales. Plus, we do want to protect our staff, our, our young staff, until we get protocols in place uh, to make those sales at the beach. So, Yes, that's a good point. Thank you, Russell. Yes, good point. Can, can I bring up a couple of, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, counselor, what, what are you looking to do here? Get input later from us, board members, or what? what what's no, the no, I'm happy to have a discussion. I, I, I would just think that it was, it's, uh, it, it is a uh, very coherent plan. So I, I would just, if we were going to, certainly it's for discussion, it's open for uh, modification. But uh, if we were going to do it, I would say just to, again, give us time, give the staff time to implement it give the public time to get ready for this for Memorial Day, give the public time and our staff time to get ready for the passes and the, uh, the again, just a general implementation. I would say um, if the board's inclined to move towards a resolution on it. So you, wanna, you, you, Brian, so you recommend we pass something tonight like this, or can we offer some changes to it and pass something so it's in place for Memorial Day? Is that what you're recommending? Yeah, if, 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 the, if the board has changes to it tonight, they certainly can discuss those. Yeah. And the resolution can be as presented and modified by, just for the clarity of the record, um, if there's a consensus on a modification, that's certainly welcome. Okay. Thank you, uh, Brian. I, I think I would actually thank everyone, um, Mark and Andrew, for the hard work and uh, the rest of our board and Russell for the input. Um, and so uh, I think what would be best, and if everyone would agree, uh, again, thanks to the hard work here, is if we can um, you know, move forward uh, with a resolution uh, to adopt the reopening guidelines in phase one. We could also post the other really nice suggestions to our website to get the public uh, some time to read it over, give us some input. Um, if we'd like to make any amendments with the rest of the uh, discussion tonight, we could make uh, amendments to these reopening guidelines, uh, but they seem like uh, it's very well thought out and in good shape. And I think this also 
uh, sets the village of Southampton up to actually uh, be a leader uh, in um, kind of beach guidelines and uh, have uh, other uh, municipalities use our guidelines as an example. Okay. Yeah, because I, I just want to go over some points, but yeah, if, if that, at least we get it Please, going. Rich, I'd, love, Rich I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear the points that you have to make. I mean, we, I guess we can either resolution it and go to discussion or we can talk about it now. And yeah, no, that's, that's really what I was trying to figure out, right? We go through the resolution first, counselor, and then, and then, and then whatever changes, if you can, you know, we have the luxury of doing afterward, but the idea is to get the resolution done first, correct? Correct. And, and, okay. and if, there is, if there was a substantive change you wanted to make now, certainly we could propose it, discuss it, if there's a consensus on it, we can, we can reflect the okay, change yeah. as modified, and it's, that's fine too. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, Brian, just to... You know, confirm we're actually making a resolution on the on the beach passes or some of the things that we've talked to so far. I think that the uh, what, what I what what I I would envision again is the mayor's motion, but what what I would envision that it would be a resolution on the beach passes, the signs, uh, the beach conduct, um, the Cooper's modifications, uh, all as presented by both you and Trustee Pilaro. Okay. Uh, if if I that, just make and, and is mod, I'm sorry, and is modified with the modification by administrator credibility. So is that? So are we talking about then approving the 18 points that came in an original email today? I'll I'll read through the ones that you know, I think is probably best. If if I mean, how about if, let me back into. Let me just you know just get to the point. A, a few a few issues of, of my and I already ran into a couple of them with uh, 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 Trustee Polaro. Um, and then whether this is applicable or not, whatever. So, well, it's on my mind. Just a, a few things for my discussions with, uh, you know, law enforcement and, and first responders and such, um, which I think you, you believed, uh, you, you covered on the beginning, Mark, there about the passes themselves, limiting three, uh, which is what it, uh, for, for village residents and then outside of the village, which are the districts, which we allow the fire in school, you want one per them until, until, June is that yeah. well June 26 being our first phase one so like the governor's so, okay June, that till yeah. now what about we do uh, uh, allow uh, first responders and so forth that represent our village what where and they don't necessarily live in the village is that their one where do they fall in this or are they then um, it doesn't sound like it's being modified it, it so the same um, privileges we allow will be continued irrespective of this. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, TCOs, I know that was, a, and, and I want to bring it up now because if that is going to be approved contingent upon this, I do think uh, board members and people need to know that there will not be sufficient staffing levels of, uh, to support um, a, a person at every beach. Uh, one of our, uh, I believe how many numbers were said, um, to monitor, so that needs to be kept in mind, certainly on, the, on, the, on an all-day basis, or uh, some at all, because uh, we still, uh, it was you know, there's a certain headcount for that that the chief has, and, um, and we still have the business district to attend to and, and the rest. So I, um, I, do, I do think the ability to um, staff TCOs or officers at every beach entrance will be a challenge, uh, so I'd like that out there. Um, bathrooms, you covered Dune Beach bathrooms. Uh, let's see, postcards you covered already as far as not handing out, possible litter. Um, one thing with bathrooms too, I wanted, uh, it was brought forth to me that some other uh, of our neighboring municipalities have brought up. Um, closing, some want to close their bathrooms, some don't. Um, but some reports have come already from other agencies as our neighbors that that is increasing increasing unruly behavior uh, people still going to the bathroom just not having a bathroom to use so they're still using they're, they're urinating and defecating on properties so keep that in mind uh, is what I was recommended as far as what we do with bathrooms in any phase um, parking of course it's been an issue of mine and, and, and again address more in the later phase about you know how we, uh, but it was addressed again 
when you move parking around in any scenario, again, or driving or anything, traffic is always, it, it's just a displacement of vehicles, not necessarily a, an elimination of thereof. So if we, we do some parking on, say, Coopers and eliminate or, or reduce, remember that that could cause a traffic jam going all the way down Meadow Lane for people to kind of come and wait, kind of like what Home Depot does now with you or stores when you get your queue to go into the store. So keep that in mind as well. And um, the bus and shuttle drop-offs um, that was brought up. Shuttles, I don't have an issue. I don't think there's so much an issue, especially if they're like, you know, with, with hotels or resorts and they've kind of been allowed all along. Um, the tour bus, which are the, long, the large coach ones that, uh, sh that go along, that's been pointed out to me that they um, – don't they get dropped off at the beach so to, and the only thing they really use are the facilities meaning the bathroom they don't really provide any they don't they purchase any item they're not there to stay on the beach so it's a tour stop um the that i uh, i thought was a good uh thing to look at is uh you know and not so much i hate to say eliminate um but that is one area um that was pointed out that brings no advantage or revenue or any anything to to the beach itself uh, other than allowing somebody to stop and enjoy it, that's great. But um, they typically use it as a stop photo and then again, use the facilities, which is really what we're trying to control and, and, and minimize there. So I think uh, bus stops, the tour bus stops, I think is something uh, we can look at. Um, and that's it. That's all I, I just, and, and, and I apologize because I do know uh, Andrew Mark did a great job and in, in organizers and talking to all the pertinent uh, people in charge for, for, for implementing this. Um, I know it's not an easy task. And, um, but those are just a few points I just want to get out there. And if you covered it already, then I apologize. Um, but that's all I had. Can I just, uh, Rich, if you don't mind, and the board just quickly. Uh, yeah, Rich, I appreciate your, your, your points because these are the things that as we're going through this, you know, the more we hear, the better we can be prepared. You know, what's the old saying, you know, you can, you can, you know, you can't predict, but you can prepare. And this is what we're doing. We are adapting right now. We're adapting to something that not many people have the answers are, the answers to. So what we're trying to do is adapt in the best way possible to give everybody an opportunity to be safe and enjoy what we now know is the best natural resource we have. So anything that someone brings up in this board is probably something that is going to be chewed on and thought about. So there is no, in my opinion, comment that really can say, okay, look, that doesn't make any sense. It does because we are all learning together right now. Right. Okay. Other, no, I'm sorry. The only other thing that um, I realized because of something that Trustee Yastrzemski said is that we do have a rule with hotels that they have a minimum purchase of 10 um, seasonal passes, 10 of the $450 passes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think we ought to give some consideration to that because that's part of of what people come and, you know, so you talk about the summer renters, uh, it, it really wouldn't tax our beach that heavily uh, because it's really, you know, it's it, it's just, you know, the, the residents who are staying at that hotel. Um, so we didn't include whether or not, so there'd be no change to that since it's not listed here. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, no, Rich, I mean, I think you made, you made some good points. Um, and, you know, as you said, everything, everything is opening up for discussion. I mean, Mark and I had a, had a discussion today with Liftopia, um, which is a reservation uh, system for parking spaces um, at beaches in, in national parks and all of that. And talking about how potentially we could, you could use them at our, at our beaches. Um, the interesting thing, and, and, and one of the things that they're saying is that, you know, this is a great way for them, their, their, their pitch is this is a great way to try and educate um, people on the way to do things differently in, in our new environment. Um, you know, I don't know that it works perfectly for us right now, um, because most of um, who, you know, who is at our beaches are our residents. You know, we only sold 8,000 daily passes at Cooper's last year. Um, we have many more spaces available, you know, over the whole entire summer. So, you know, for the residents, I, I don't think trying to put in a, a reservation, whether it's free or not or whatever, would be, that would be one added, you know, one other added 
um, tax for them. But you know, could it be something that we would look at in the future to say, hey, um, know that you're going to have a space when you get down to the beach. Um, you know, residents don't have to pay anything. You could pay a daily fee. You could bundle it with food. You could bundle it with chair and umbrella. You know, who knows? Um, but again, just one of the new things that whoever thought that we might be thinking about doing an online reservation system at our beaches across Southampton. So there are lots of, of, of newnesses and, and lots of things coming up. Um, you know, I think one of the things also that we, we asked our, our uh, you know, our attorney about was the ADA mat um, that we have installed down. Yeah, the mobile and, mat. Uh, the Moby mat, exactly. And, um, you know, again, changing times. Do we need to have it? Do we not need to have it? Well, we certainly don't want to discriminate against anyone. So, you know, again, and to Matt and the manager there, um, you know, he, he would like to have two, one going up and one going down. Um, and, and be able to utilize that so that we do have open access to our beaches um, for, for the people who want to come down. So, you know, one of the other great things is that we know that UV lighting is something that, um, that you know, could potentially clean and cleanse and disinfect. So, you know, would we hire um, a company that comes in and really sanitizes and cleans our bathrooms on a X number of you know, a week, or is it daily, or is it, you know, come in and, and really clean the bathrooms for us, um, especially at Cooper's. So, uh, you know, and, and possibly even in the village, um, you know, we've got bathrooms that, that are closed right now that it would be nice to be able to open up um, so that some of our restaurants uh, don't feel like they're being taken advantage of and um, having people ask to use theirs because the public restrooms are closed. Um, which, which the public shouldn't be doing right now anyway. Um, so yeah, everything is open for discussion. Um, and, and again, this is really just the first phase um, through June 26. And then we can reevaluate, reassess and come back to the board. We've got, you know, we've got a meeting at the end of this month. You know, we'll have two meetings, um, I believe, prior to June 26. And so we'll, uh, we, we hopefully should know a lot more on you know, where Suffolk County and Long Island in general stands on, 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 its, on its reopening phases, so. Very good. Excellent. I think we should be really happy with, uh, with this, uh, this, this first draft and our initial plan. I think it was a great job. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Trustee Pilaro, Trustee Parrish, and the rest of the board. Um, before we uh, keep this moving here, does anyone else, any other board members have any comments? Just or, uh, one that came up yesterday, uh, which was the surf schools. And I don't, it, they realize that we need to obviously uh, mitigate and adapt. And everyone thinks that this is a very good phase one, but they themselves want to help us with that. And they don't want to encourage, you know, a lot of activity. So they're, they're going to look at this, but Mark and Andrew, just had this discussion uh, last night. You may just want to reach out to, you know, Steve Delaney and a few others who are thinking about it. That's right. Thank you very much. We will definitely uh, consult with the uh, uh, the surf committee on that. Uh, so, uh, with that being said, uh, we can look at the resolutions when we get to the suggested resolutions uh, portion of the meeting. Uh, but we're, if we're okay, uh, I'd like to be able to move to the, uh, the discussion item through the Chamber of Commerce regarding the, the farmer's market. Uh, so uh, with that said, uh, Russell, um, I'll let you uh, take this one. Thank you, everyone. Again. Okay, so we have correspondence from uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, and its new president, Bessem uh, Kujak, I think is how it's pronounced. Uh, and uh, he included in, your, in uh, his documentation and materials, uh, the Long Island Farmers Market Joint Resource Document, um, in which they have a pandemic management plan uh, included. Um, and the New York State Ag and Markets has put out interim guidance for the operation of farmers markets. Um, and based upon that, he is uh, stating in his letter that uh, he will be certain that, uh, that if permitted to open uh, on uh, Sunday, May 24th, uh, 
that they would, uh, they, following all of the suggested guidelines and putting the protocols in place, um, they're looking to get the farmer's market started. So, um, you know, again, I will let the board ask questions if, if they have any. I'm not certain if, if, if I can answer them, but, uh, you know, essentially it's been deemed that uh, it is permitted uh, as long as they follow so, uh, social uh, distancing and, and all of the guidelines. Um, they're not allowed to have entertainment. There are certain, certain I, things that, that normally they would be allowed to do that they're not going to be permitted to do. However, the actual farmer's market um, uh, is a permitted activity. I will, I'll start by making a comment. I uh, got an email from Bessem also, and I saw the plan. It's a very good plan. Um, the one thing I asked him right away is, you know, clarification from, from the state and the county, and then I guess they are deemed essential. The only question I had to him is, and I expressed it, are we then promoting gathering? But I guess as you look at it now, I mean, I'm, I, as a business person, I would think that this would be something that would be would be good for the people who are in the farmers market so we have to look at that also but then there's the villas and promoting gathering but then again if we're getting people to the beach in essence are we doing the same thing so it's a it's one of those things that i think about and i wonder okay what is the best scenario here and based on this plan and the recommendations from you know those beyond just the chamber it looks pretty solid. And I don't know, Brian, there's anything that you can weigh on and about, you know, is this something the village should be entertaining or not? Yeah. So um, thank you. You, you know, it's uh, it, you're right. It is one of those very gray areas where it, it is something essential. And then also considered congregating or promoting a mass gathering. Uh, same thing can be said with the lines outside supermarkets, you know, exactly. the, and this is a food service. So, so um, we know from the county executive's guidance that he gets from the state that um, farmers markets are considered essential, so they are permitted. And I think the farmers market industry is trying their best just to try to get a reasonable um, and safe approach. So I think that um, if the board is comfortable with the proposed uh, regulations that's, be, that's, that's proposed here for the farmers market, then I would be comfortable with uh, this being approved um, being that it's an essential business. And I might add, if, if I just, if I, if you don't mind, that last weekend I had reason that I needed to be on the North Fork uh, both Saturday and Sunday. Um, and every farm stand is open, you know, um, and they do have, pro and, and I will say almost all of them that I passed uh, clearly had demarcations and, and ways that, that, that they allowed people to shop. And it was a very, very busy weekend. Um, so, so the uh, farm stands are are permitted to be open, and they are open. And I guess this is considered an extension of a farm stand in some ways. Sure. Sure. I mean, the I think the, the important I part to... is. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, no, sure. I think the important part is is that again, the county uh, again coming down, you know, working down through the system, the state, and then the county has uh, deemed it, you know, as as. Um, Essential, non-essential, whatever, but 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 appropriate to operate. I think is a nice, but better way of putting it. Essential, and uh, and again, anything that's promoting people to get you know get to work and get their wares out there, um, I'm all for as long as they adhere. I've, I'm you know I read the documents here that Bessem sent, both his own, you know, version of it, and and of course what came down from the state, and um, you know like like Trustee Palaro said earlier, you know we we you got to give people a chance to to do it and do the right thing and then they don't well then you worry about uh, uh, you know hammering down as some people use terminology or enforcing but i think they have a good good plan in place there plus uh you know it's been all winter long without getting uh, our favorite pickles from the pickle guy so open it up all right uh the only thing i, I as i would add is um could make sense just to shoot a quick note over to uh, Dr. Piggott, the County Commissioner of Health, or and or maybe Trustee Allen, if you'd like to bring it up on uh, tomorrow's county call, it'll be a, it'll be a busy one because there's some announcements coming. But it could be good just to uh, just to get the eyes and ears of of the County Executive and County Health Commissioner on this. Uh, it should be fine, but would like to get uh, their uh, you know blessing on this as well. 
Sure, I'll ask that question. And I think we also have to emphasize that this is real farm. This is produce and food. It's not, you know, t-shirts and other items, which I think Bessem laid out in his letter nicely. So happy may to ask, ask that question. May I ask from an administrative standpoint, uh, Brian, uh, we approved the Chamber of Commerce's um, summer plans with the caveat pending, uh, you know, uh, regulations by, uh, you know, COVID-19 and essential and non-essential. So in, am I correct in assuming that we can just administratively tell them that it's okay, we don't need to pass a resolution since it has been approved pending? Yes. Yep. Okay. Oh, oh, and, in, and in this new world, almost everything is. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. All right. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for that discussion. Uh, number three is the Southampton High School graduation. And uh, we've had some good conversations uh, with the high school, with Dr. Dino. Uh, we've obviously told them that we're very supportive of, uh, of the needs uh, and recognition of, uh, of our students. Uh, and so um, he's been in touch with myself and with Russell. So Russell, if you can kind of just elaborate as to our conversation with Dr. Dino and what we'd like to do. So, uh, and, and, and kudos to uh, Southampton High School. Um, uh, I have a senior in, in Sag Harbor and they're, they're just getting started in their planning now. Um, so I'm, I'm, this is uh, using this uh, uh, program here and, 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 and seeing if we can pass that on so that uh, my, my uh, hometown uh, high school can do something similar. Um, they're looking to hold their events on Friday, June 26th. Um, they'd like to make it a celebration for the class of, of 2020. At approximately uh, two to three o'clock, three o'clock, they'll have a motor uh, parade for the graduates uh, uh, through the village. Um, you know, they're going to decorate cars and so forth. They're going to have security team will be responsible for the logistics um, to make sure that uh, the grads are maintaining social distancing and they line the cars up properly. Um, they uh, obviously are going to ask the uh, Southampton Village Police Department. Uh, to be available to assist as well. I think there have been some conversations with the chief um, and his command staff. Um, and then they'd like to wrap up the live portion of the graduation with a celebration around five to six o'clock so that families can turn home and watch a, uh, a broadcast of the virtual ceremony. Um, and then they're also going to reach out through our business community to see if uh, they'd like to offer any, you know, graduation dinner spe takeout specials and, and other types of things that would be available um, for them. Um, again, from a planning standpoint, I think tonight what we'd like to do is uh, if the board has recommendations of changes or anything they'd like to see, uh, we can re relay that back to them, uh, give them that uh, we're in favor, and then they could probably give us a, a, you know, their finalized plan for formal approval at our next board meeting. So that would, that, that's how I see this. Um, I know that the mayor, uh, you've been involved in it uh, quite a bit. So you may, may want to add a little more to it. I, I think that's perfect. Um, any input would be very helpful. And then we can go back to Dr. Dino and, uh, and our schools, and then we could uh, um, uh, pass a resolution at our next meeting, um, allowing um, the, uh, our high school students to uh, celebrate in some way, even though it's not the, uh, the way that we all expected. Can I just ask uh, one thing, Mayor? Or just actually, I just want to make sure that since the chief is here with us, that uh, chief, are you, uh, you okay with the, the route and everything that the school is proposing? Yeah, m my school resource officers were part of the planning process, so we're good. I'm sorry, what? Our school resource officers were part of the planning, so okay. we're in good shape. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Trustee uh, Yastrzemski. Uh, next uh, on our discussion item is the Rotary Club Firecracker 5K uh, regarding a date change. Um, relatively self-explanatory, but if Russell, if there's anything else that you'd like to uh, uh, add, please do. If not, we can, you know, obviously address that in our uh, later on in the meeting. Again, this is a situation where they, uh, it's scheduled, if I'm not mistaken, 4th of July weekend. Uh, Julie, you're on unmute. Is that correct? Yes, uh, it's scheduled for Sunday, July 5th. And what they're asking for is if needed, and they're, they still haven't made you know, the final decision, but if needed, would we permit them to move the event to Sunday, October 11th, which is the Sunday of Columbus Day weekend? So, um, so I think, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Well, kind of, kind of uh, before we get into that, Mayor, if you don't mind, may I kind of take this opportunity to discuss a few things that are kind of already pending in addition to the Rotary. This is the latest one to come up, but we still have the other two races, the marathons uh, that have been put towards the fall that I, I, I'm not quite sure we made a decision upon, um, which also gets into up, upcoming things, Memorial Day ceremony, uh, 4th of July parade, what to do, or fireworks, uh, the fresh air home. Um, so I, 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 if you don't mind, Russell, if you could, if you have any insight onto this, these are all, you know, we have many impending situations here, events and, and celebrations. Um, maybe we can take the time to kind of discuss, in addition to the Rotary, how, how we're going to handle these. Well, we have officially canceled um, an event that was going to be um, this upcoming weekend was going was going to the be Memorial the, Day. You mean? Um, no, the weekend before Memorial Day was supposed to be the uh, women's half marathon. Um, and that Correct. was, that was canceled and they have requested for, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Sunday, October 4th. Is that correct, Julie? Yes, actually they their scheduled originally was for Saturday, May 30th, but mm -hmm. they right. requested to move to Sunday, October 4th. This okay. weekend was American Heart Association, the Cycle Nation, which they have asked and we said, the, the board said yes, um, that they could move to Saturday, October 3rd. Uh, so we have, we have the Heart Association, we have the bicycle thing on the yeah. third Saturday, and we have the... Um, and then the half marathon on Half Sunday. marathon on Sunday the third, that's the new one. What right. about the Hamptons one? There was discussion of whether there were concerns and discussion of whether we really wanted to continue to actually, you know, actually do that. Where are we at with that? They have been asking and are hoping that they were planning on to do it the weekend prior, which I believe is Saturday, September 26th. Um, that was, that's always been their date. They, this would be okay. a fifth year. Um, okay. so that's actually kind of been on hold on our books. Okay. Um, and and I did to to add to that, I did provide to the board um, the analysis um, and the comments of our uh, our chief of the ambulance and our chief of police mm -hmm. uh, with regards to both of those events. Because um, that's the concern, I, you know, that's the concern that's been certainly relayed to me, uh, especially now these are all, well, then again, they're all piling up and they're, they're always back to back anyways, but certainly those are piling up in October. Um, you know, Russ, what do we got going on with Memorial Day? Um, we're doing a, there's a reduced. There's uh, a, there's a, that's a, that, right. That's, um, that's actually the, that's actually the next, that's actually the next topic that we're on the discussion items, number five. Um, I don't have a number five, sorry. I, I, yeah, you, you, there was a, uh, uh, oh, okay. two items that, that came in as far as, uh, updates that was important to get on yeah. here. Okay. Um, so so that, that'll be the next that'll be the next topic. Okay. Uh, so, so let's just talk about the marathon since you brought them up. The two marathons, um, one was never approved. Uh, the the Hamptons Marathon um, has 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 yet to have an approval uh, by the village. We um, and we have our comment. And generally, when we work through whether we're going to approve it or not. Uh, we work through the comments of our emergency services group, um, our, our DPW, and, and others uh, as part of the decision. Um, the, the women's half marathon is an approved event for which it needed to be postponed due to the uh, coronavirus. And they're tentatively looking for, again, because we, again, we don't know what October is going to bring. We don't know whether or not we're still going to be in a situation in which... Right. You, you can't do things, but but they would like um, to move it to, um, and the proposal would be move it to that Sunday, October 4th, um, and that be a date that would be firm either way, and if in fact they couldn't run, they would have to run some sort of a virtual uh, marathon of some kind, but uh, that that's where they stand, okay. um, and we are trying to um, as people look to either move or, or, or go to virtual. Uh, um, Julie got information today of, of 
two events that uh, are just going to be canceled um, uh, because uh, they're just not looking to, to which, reschedule. Which ones are those, if you don't mind me asking, by the way, which, which sure, two of those? Actually, are. one is the August 2nd Hope for Depression walk. Um, they just informed me today that due to the uncertainty, mm -hmm. uh, they felt that they would postpone it, do something virtual, but they would be looking forward to rejoining us out here in 2021. I think it might be helpful to everyone's point to understand who has a plan B and what that date is for a plan B and who's definitively canceled and see how these fall out in the end of September and October because it looks like a lot is getting compressed in those two, three weeks. And we have two on one weekend, which is Columbus Day weekend or maybe the weekend before. I think we just need to have a better picture of how they all fall on these dates. And the bike races, and Chief, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong on that. The bike races, I've always been told, they're, because they're allowed to bike on, on open roads, we do right. try to ask if they can alter their route, if it's in conflict with something else. But for the most part, um, the Cycle Nation ride for the American Heart Association also goes through the townships as well. So it's a multi-level, um, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. a, or at least just to, to make everybody aware. But I, I don't know if we've ever said no. The bike rides are low impact usually. Mm -hmm. You just have a steady stream because people are spread out by the time they get here. Right. Okay. Um, I do, I can also say that the Fresh Air Home um, has reached out. They would like to try to do something as far as fireworks, but don't know if they'll be able to do anything, um, but they feel they've done it for over 30 years and they would hate to, and they, they know it's a big part of the summer and certainly enjoyed by so many people. Um, so they're kind of a bit in a holding pattern as, as most are, I think, in that they would like to be able to do something. They won't have, I don't believe that they will have their big event, but they would like to do some kind of a fireworks display, if at all possible, but they're just not sure what that could look like. Um, and obviously that's something that the board and chief will have to talk about to see if there's any even suggestions for that. So they're really in a kind of a holding pattern also. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and the phrase, well, we'll discuss in item number five, according to Russell. So. So what I'm hearing is uh, we'll take no action tonight on the Rotary, Rotary Club Firecracker uh, 5K. Um, obviously, it's in October, so another 12 days to uh, address that won't affect I don't mind, that much. Oh, I don't mind moving that. But, I mean, I don't mind moving that to 11th because that's we've always had. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I, that's. I didn't mean to imply I had a. a I'm trying to figure out. You know, we already got the 20. I wrote the other ones down already. Firecracker is one of our original or oldest ones. I have no problem moving up to the 11th right now. Okay. But that's me. All right. Thank you, Trustee uh, Yashremsky. Uh, we will uh, we'll obviously take, uh, take note of all this. And uh, with that said, we can uh, move forward to a discussion item number five, which is the combined Veterans Memorial Day service. So this has been in the works for, I, I'm going to say the better part of eight, eight to 10 days. Um, uh, most of the uh, veteran services throughout Long Island, um, and of course the announcement that was made by the County Executive Ballone that he felt it'd be very important that uh, that Memorial Day have some uh, sort of, of remembrance, public remembrance. Uh, and uh, most of the veterans groups have gotten together and, and most are doing uh, either identical or very similar types of, of uh, events, I'll call it. Um, it's a, a no parade, um, essentially a non-public event, although it's going to be held in a public place. So obviously, um, Agawam Park is a, is a public park. Uh, if people are in the park walking around and they stop to listen, you know, certainly they can. Um, you know, certainly we would would want to have uh, um, some sort of presence there to make certain that we don't congregate too many people. But th it's going to be an invitation only, uh, the veterans uh, group, uh, the board of trustees, 
uh, they have a, uh, a, a strong guest uh, speaker and uh, you know, the, the, the normal uh, uh, you know, uh, process that they go through each year um, after the parade. Uh, it'll be an hour long at the most at 11 o'clock. Uh, we've run this past our, uh, our parks and, and buildings uh, uh, maintenance crews. Uh, it's very doable. Um, simple setup of the of our platforms seats set up uh, minimum six feet apart and uh, again a very short and solemn but uh, uh, good remembrance of of uh, those who uh, suffered the ultimate sacrifice um, and uh, it would be on uh, on Memorial Day at 11 o'clock okay so the only, thing we've, the only thing we've removed is the actual parade leading up to um, the park ceremony. So we're going to have a, a more or less a, a condensed version of the ceremony starting at 11 o'clock. That is correct. Okay. And, and the board. Russell, and, I believe they were also going to try to live stream it as well. Yeah. The, the key is that they really are working on trying to live stream it and then publicize to people that it's not a public event, but, but if, if you want to play, pay homage to, to those who have served and, and sacrificed uh, that that they could could watch it um, live stream, and I'm and we're working um, with multiple outlets to try to make certain that that we get that done. Yeah. And Bob and Grisnick and everybody is aware of this and on board with it. Bob Grisnick and Bill Jones were in my office three times in the last two days. Cool, perfect. Um, I also reached out to uh, Chief Cummings today um, as well, and. Uh, He's, unless he feels differently now, um, he was comfortable this afternoon at uh, one o'clock when I spoke to him. Thank you. We'll be giving details so that we can uh, publicize it on our village website as well, so that the public is aware. Um, so then while we're at it, any discussion with, with, with Bob and Bill about, uh, and, and the chief about um, 4th of July? Is that completely done? I'm assuming the answer is yes, but I'm still receiving questions. So, I haven't received from the veterans, uh, combined veterans, uh, you know, the official announcement that they're that they're not trying. But um, as of the last time it came, you know, because I think they're so focused on making sure that this is done, uh, Memorial Day is done appropriately and effectively. Um, you know, we we haven't really spoke right. about it, but it. it they know that it's 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 highly unlikely that we'd be able to put something right, together right. given circumstances. And somebody in the hospital asked me because then people who actually prepare for these things do it so far in advance. Um, so the answer is, is, is it's uh, my answer was that it's highly unlikely, based on conditions and and directives we're getting from above us that there will be no. Great. I think the best thing to do is is when we add we'll have a conversation tomorrow when I speak with uh, um, Bob and Bill. Uh, to finalize that, and when we advertise and and speak about what's going to happen on Memorial Day, they can make their announcement with regards to the Fourth of July. I, I I can't see where you know everything else is being canceled at this time. I, I don't see where where that's right. going to be able to happen. Of course. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, for the discussion there. Uh, the final discussion item um, comes from the Southampton Art Center, uh, the drive-in movie at Cooper's Beach, uh, May 23rd and 24th, 2020. So this is something that we've been working very closely with uh, Southampton Art Center. Uh, wanted to thank the leadership of Simone Levinson, uh, as well as uh, Ellen Cronmeyer, Whitney Stevens, uh, Godfrey, uh, as well as uh, Amy Kerwin uh, for their help. Uh, and uh, we have been able to actually uh, accelerate this. Um, and in addition to uh, potential future uh, drive-in movies. Uh, this is a great uh, opportunity to bring uh, bring everyone together, uh, and it's a great opportunity to do some fundraising. Uh, we were initially thinking doing this in July and August, but uh, through the work with uh, with Simone, we've actually been able to uh, secure uh, equipment to actually launch this Memorial Day weekend. And combined with the uh, governor's uh, New York Forward, uh, that allows for actor activities on 515. Uh, this is now a reality, and uh, Southampton Village uh, could be one of the first municipalities to really kick this off. And so um, there's a, a letter uh, distributed to everyone from 
uh, Simone uh, Levinson and the SAC uh, and, uh, you know, asking uh, for, uh, you know, authorization uh, to explore the, the idea of having a drive-in movie on uh, May 23rd and May 24th, Memorial Day weekend. So um, there'll be additional um, uh, updates here. Um, you know, she says noted, uh, and as uh, Mayor Warren, SEC co-founder Simone Levinson has been discussing, SAC would like to partner with Southampton Village in execution with these events. Details to be determined, but include providing ballast to secure the inflatable screen. Gary has, who's done a nice job as well, has kindly um, reached out to Godfrey um, and uh, respectively request that village fees be waived in this regard. And they, they thank us for considering. Um, and they, uh, they also uh, are, are very appreciative of the work that we all have been doing. So, um, and it says next weekend's proposed films will serve as a test uh, for consideration uh, in the extension of the Cooper's Beach series in July and August. And then it says also, please note that this inquiry is separate and apart from the proposed drive-in fundraising event uh, that they're exploring on August 21st, which is their big fundraiser. So uh, finally, as they say, as discussed and requested under separate cover, look forward to connecting with Cooper's Beach concessionaire as soon as possible to discuss the August 21st event. Um, and obviously feel free to reach out to Tom Dunn. Thank you, Tom Dunn as well um, regarding this. So um, Ope would like to kind of get some thoughts here, but this is a very um, exciting opportunity uh, for, uh, for us as a village board to, uh, to explore. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I, I know Jesse, you and I had a discussion a long time ago about, uh, you know, about drive-in movies and how they're kind of making a comeback because you can socially distance uh, and all of that. I, I, I would want to, I think we need to see how it plays in because uh, we already show movies down at the beach on Monday nights. Um, and I, I, I think the Chamber of Commerce does that does that in conjunction with us. So I, I'd love to kind of hear um, kind of what the partnership between us and SAC would be, you know, and, and all of that. I think that's important for us to, to kind of understand what exactly they're looking for from the village. Yeah, but just note also, we could have a special meeting, which I'd be happy to do, but I don't believe we have an additional uh, meeting between now and when, um, the SAC is looking to do the drive, the drive-in movie. Uh, so if if we're not ready to um, allow this tonight, uh, we might want to schedule a a special meeting uh, before this, just so we can authorize it. Do you do you know what they're looking for for from the village? I mean, for, uh, with us as a partner, do you have an idea of of what what it would entail? Russell, I think you uh, might want to you might be able to jump in here and provide some more information. I just want so, to speak. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. Um, you know, I've, I've been in uh, uh, contact with Tom Dunn uh, quite a bit, uh, you know, regarding a lot of things uh, with the Southampton Arts Center. You know, obviously, they've had to postpone uh, a great deal of their programming. Um, and their programming is, is the, this time of year is their largest source of fundraising. So they're trying to be as creative as possible, uh, be good neighbors and still offer, you know, programming and, and be able to, uh, I'll say sustain, um, is, is really the right word. Um, so they've really broken this down into, into two type of categories. Um, one is not, they're not really prepared to, uh, you know, put forth in front of the board. However, the starting steps of that is that they're looking to move their largest fundraiser, the one that they uh, they hold on the on the on the lawn every year, uh, and essentially make that a drive-in movie on August 21st. Um, you know, they've already preliminary put some plans together. Um, they understand we have a, a, a built-in concessionaire down there. Um, we've already uh, matched up uh, conversations uh, or, or in the process of, of matching up conversations. I've had individual conversations with both uh, um, Ben and Lauren uh, as well as Tom uh, to work out a, a partnership there. This next coming weekend, what they're looking to do is instead of asking for an entire summer event schedule with regards to potentially doing drive-in uh, movies, and they're understanding that, um, you know, it appears that concerts in the park aren't, uh, you know, aren't likely to happen, um, and understanding that the Chamber of Commerce does their drive-in movies. Um, they wanted to do a trial run. They wanted to see, um, 
you know, not necessarily a trial run, but more along the lines of saying, let's definitively pick two dates that aren't conflicting um, their prime dates, but aren't conflicting with um, anything else that is going on. Um, uh, you know, see how that works, see how successful it is, see what the village thinks, see what the residents think, um, and, and then potentially come back to us and propose either an altered plan for the rest of the summer or, um, you know, or, or a similar plan that would take place. Um, I think they're thinking either Fridays or Saturday nights. Um, uh, Tom assured me that uh, they would reach out to the Chamber of Commerce and, and, and speak with them uh, to make certain that this isn't a, you know, a, a competition. Um, the board may feel that that you know having two nights of drive-ins is 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 too much but this really is a standalone for next weekend um and what they're asking for from the village um is uh if uh the chief needs to bring in additional staff that we would normally uh charge uh someone they're looking for a wave of that fee they're looking for the wave of fees of some uh a, a custodial and maintenance uh help uh from dpw uh, we do often waive uh, fees for um, our partners that share uh, or use our buildings. Um, we, we often waive fees for History Museum and, and SCC. Um, so, so that's pretty much an overview of what they're looking to do. Yes, I think they have their eyes and their hopes on potentially expanding this, but I think they wanted to just take it one step at a time. Uh, see if the village would allow them to go Saturday the 23rd and 24th um, and have an evaluation from there. Okay, great. Can I ask you one thing quick, Russ? Um, I don't have a problem with because that's I just want to make sure what you just explained. It was just for next weekend, essentially, for now. Um, but part of it is the waiving of uh, costs and overtime, and that's really what that boils down to is overtime. And they're looking for us to waive it as a village um, board for them for the next two to uh, 23rd and 24th. Is that something there, uh, is that part of the dialogue for uh, future consideration as well? We didn't get into too much details okay. about that. And I think part of that has to do with the fact of- I don't wanna, I don't wanna hold that carrot out thinking that that may not be the case for future. Right, because the Chamber of Commerce, um, they handle their own cleanup. They handle sure. their own, right. So they right. do their setup, they do their cleanup. Right. They're, asking, they're asking for some assistance on this event. And I think part of the evaluation that's gonna be taken into account moving forward is are they going to have to lean on us or the village um, you know, to, to subsidize their fundraising. Um, and I think that's part of, of you know, the, the uh, learn through the first weekend. Okay. okay. And are they looking- Do we know what they're- Sorry. Go ahead, Kimberly. I think we're asking the same question. Go ahead. <laughs> Do we know what they're going to be charging for this? Was that your question? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, he did, he did tell me it was, it was, it was relatively reasonable, especially given what I understand they're looking to charge on uh, August uh, 21st. But if I, please don't hold it to me, but I, I believe it was something like $50 a car. All right. So they're looking to charge for next Saturday and Sunday because they don't, they don't typically charge for their, not typically, they don't charge for their movies every Friday night movies in the summer oh. and, you know, in, in the yard, that's free, but they get it underwritten through sponsorships. Correct. So the move to drive a movie, they're looking to bank 50 ahead, 50 a car. I, I don't hold me to the 50, but yes, this is going to be a reservation pay in advance, uh, you know, um, event. And that's the same price point that the chamber charges. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've always thought they were, I mean, I, quite honestly, I always thought that was a pretty high course point. I, I know that's what, you know, but, but I think I've, always, I've, I've always been a minority on that. But, uh, right. Just so the board knows, um, approximately in, in discussions, we learned that the price just for a rental could be, you know, almost $10,000. Right. Um, and then there's a goal of you and be able to purchase um, equipment as well. So we can continue to do this throughout the summer. Um, so while $50 does seem expensive per car, uh, the costs are just extremely high in order to pull this off. And so uh, it's I, and I, I understand a hard place. Right. No, no, I understand that, Mayor, uh, clearly. Um, that's why other municipalities west of us have been offering 
movies free of charge um um because it is costly but they've been doing it where they haven't you know they, they've done it on the side of buildings they, they, they found other ways to kind of do it a little more cost effective where they're not charging the residents um you know again as, as a as a cost of doing business and, and, and to run it yes i understand that's uh, it's a, it's a especially the, you know the, the, the apparatus and equipment to um to set it up but Okay. Also, the hope is to find some sponsors, and I'm sure we will find plenty of people uh, to donate. And then if that's the case, then it could be offered for free. Um, so I'm sure we'll get there. Um, this is really a trial, but uh, ultimately, I'm sure uh, many of our residents will want to step up and help promote this and help sponsor it. And there's probably other businesses as well. So it will likely move in that direction for sure. Okay. All right. Um, just, can, I, can I ask one question of the chief? Chief, seeing how this is Memorial Day weekend, um, and they're looking to have us waive fees uh, for our officers. Is this overtime? Is it overtime as well as holiday pay? Uh, not really. I mean, it could be overtime depending on what else is going on. If, if uh, things aren't, if there isn't anything happening, we, we shouldn't have any overtime. If, okay. if it's busy, then we just have to pull, hold somebody over on the, the back end for traffic control, which would be pretty quick, maybe an and, hour. And yeah, and holiday pay is is a separate payment for okay. us. Not all not all municipalities. It's a good question, but not for for us. It's it's a straight. Okay, I just want to comment. I think it's a great idea, and uh, it is a pilot. And I think right now we should be able to give people the opportunity to go out and do something because we have been holed up in our houses for two months. And I think it's really? a great way for the art center to get back to doing what they want to do. And also, as you said, it is a way for them to you know, who've missed out on two months of, you know, fundraising, why not? It's a trial, it's a test pilot, let's do it. And then we can work, work out from there. And then as the mayor said, fundraising, all these other things can sort of come in. I think as a village right now, we should be flexible. And they're not stepping on anybody else's toes because nobody was holding movies this weekend, no. right? It's the first chance we have and there's a lot of pent up demand to go out. I just hope it doesn't rain. I think it's a great idea. No rain, no snow. So I think what would be excellent if it's okay with the board is to add this to another uh, uh, suggested resolution uh, towards yeah. the end of the meeting. Uh, yeah. And then we could, uh, we could pass this and, and uh, give the uh, art center the green light for uh, our first uh, drive-in movie for the summer. So I just want to make sure that's okay with everyone. Yes. Good. Excellent. Okay, Russell, so we can uh, uh, create a resolution or Brian, thank you. Um, if it's okay uh, with the group here, I'd love to take a 90 second recess uh, before we go into the public hearings, which should be pretty quick. Um, if that's all right, I'm just gonna go put this on, on mute and, uh, and uh, we'll do a quick 90 second recess. Sure. Okay, sure. thank you everyone. Number one, number one of 2020, uh, exceeding the tax cap to be adjourned uh, to May 26th. So, uh, uh, Brian, if you don't mind, just uh, giving us a quick, a quick um, uh, description here, and then we could proceed. Sure. Thank you, Thank you Mayor. Um, this was, uh, you recall that the board passed uh, the authorization to exceed the tax cap, uh, the Pierce the tax cap. Uh, turns out that we did not actually need it in our budget. So, to make that effective, we actually have to repeal that local law. Uh, there was a, based on the timing, which is not unusual in the village of Southampton with Thursday, Tuesday meetings, which is something strategically we may discuss into the future. Um, there was a difficulty meeting the press, uh, Village Hall had a difficulty meeting the press publication deadline. So the request is that this be withdrawn and then re-noticed for the May 26th meeting. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Brian, do we do we need to uh, to adjourn this or just uh, let it be? Um, no, uh, yeah, it, it just we just need a resolution to adjourn it to May twenty sixth. Do we open? Do we have to open it first, Brian? Officially, just if it no. wasn't properly noticed, you don't. Got it. Okay, so we can address this uh, later on in the uh, the resolution section. Yeah, this uh, would be a resolution. I'm sorry. Yes, this would be a resolution. Okay, excellent. Uh, so next we have communications to the board. Brian, just to get your guidance here, does that make sense to um, uh, 
do all these. We, we do have the, these in our, our packets. There is two that I think we should definitely speak about, number two and uh, number five, which is a really good update from the Business Revitalization Committee. Uh, but other than those two, uh, what do you think? Should we just run through these or should we just, you know, these... Yeah, these, these are communications to the board. These can be summarized by the village administrator. They don't need to be re read in, uh, in detail. They just need to be summarized. Got it. Thanks, Brian. So, Russell, you can kick this off number one from uh, NICOM. Essentially, NICOM is uh, given guidance on if the village was interested in asking the governor uh, to enact uh, a, a, an executive order to extend the period of time that people could pay their tax payments without interest to penalty. He gives, uh, he gives guidance as to how you would write that letter. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, this next, next communication is from the Southampton uh, Planning Commission uh, advisory comments. Again, the uh, Planning Commission at its May meeting uh, reviewed a proposal letter uh, from Lee Mindell of uh, Shelton Mindell, and the Planning Commission believes that the study outlined in the proposal would be extremely helpful. Um, so the, uh, if the proposal is uh, authorized by the village, they look forward to working with that team. Thank you very much, uh, Russell. Um, uh, I would also like to, uh, to communicate uh, to everyone, I think this is a great, uh, great project. Um, and would love, would love it to be considered. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the revitalization projects uh, been vetted uh, by, uh, by Paul Travis and CMAC Sammy. Um, you know, uh, we've, you know, I know the board has asking for a specific project. This is one of them. So uh, we'd just love for everyone to take the time to reach out to Chairperson Paul Travis, get some more information uh, with the hope of, of uh, adopting this uh, in the future uh, and uh, something that uh, could be very exciting. Uh, for us, and then uh, you know, Trustee Polaro and I also met uh, with uh, with James Lima, uh, who's got a great uh, urban planning and architectural design firm, um, and he was working uh, last year uh, with the Planning Commission on um, some updates uh, to the hospital, which you know a lot has changed since then. But um, just want to let everyone know that uh, Trustee Polaro and I had a really good meeting with James Lima as well. So uh, with that said, uh, the third is from Matthew Weeks. Uh, Russell, I'll let you take that one as well. Thank you, Russell. Uh, Matthew Weeks, who is the uh, Cooper's Beach manager, um, hoping to reappoint uh, again this evening. Uh, essentially, he's just uh, stating the fact that uh, he feels it's very important uh, that we get service down at Cooper's Beach. Um, he's had uh, several instances in which uh, uh, better cell service would have uh, would have been um, uh, very very helpful. So he's in support of of the of the village board um, trying to get better cell service down in the Cooper's Beach area. Thank you, Russell. Uh, number four of East End Financial Group. East End Financial Group is the group that uh, manages our money for the uh, fire department's LOSAP program. Um, they've been very generous and uh, they're going to give across uh, their uh, clients on Long Island a combined $10,000 to Long Island food pantries. Um, they're looking to make a $500 monetary donation in the name of the Southampton Village Fire Department uh, to the uh, food pantry of our choice. Um, and all they're looking for from us is to uh, some guidance as to where they would send that money. Thank you, Russell. And number five, uh, Business Revitalization Committee. Um, just real quick on the on the last one, uh, we seem we we seem to have a, a a a prominent food pantry in the village, and I just wanted uh, the board's opinion if uh, we thought Heart of the Hamptons was, uh, or if they had, and if the board had any other thoughts. If you want to wait, and I can send it by email, and you can give your comments. But um, you know, that's uh, we we can move on to the next one. Um, the I'm sorry, the, Russ, as far as the LOSAP donation? Yeah, as far as the $500, yeah. Yeah, I have no problem giving it to Heart of the Hamptons is our main Southampton um, agency. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, the members of the Business Revitalization Committee are requesting a grant to be used towards marketing communications for the village. Um, they've had some success in promoting village businesses of all kinds, as well as village events, uh, such as the Parade of uh, Lights. Um, and they think now uh, in, in trying to help businesses come out uh, of this, uh, uh, the, the effects of COVID-19, 
um, they're looking for some funds to uh, to help uh, in the form of a grant to help the businesses uh, move forward. I think that uh, I, I do think that there may be comments on that from other members of the of the board. All right, if there are, uh, please. We're all I think we're all in full full support of this. I'll start off with it. And I'll give uh, Kimberly, Al, and I are uh, sit on the. We oversee the BRC, as we call it, Business Revitalization Committee. That I believe there's about twelve to fourteen members that are were, were that were um, resolutioned in over, I'd say eight eight months ago, eight to ten months ago, and I have not been on every single one, but I've been on a lot of them in person and through Zoom. And they are really, really communicating very well. They're doing a lot of hard work. And, you know, with the subject of the website, um, we know now how important, you know, communication is through websites and social media. Uh, about two years ago, the Southampton Fest committee was given a grant for $10,000. And what we chose to do at that particular point was how could we help our businesses? How could we help the downtown in terms of them marketing themselves? And so, what the committee decided to do at that point, the Southampton Fest Committee, was to get involved with a local company called Dead On Design, which is based in Southampton as a marketing and website builder, and to give the village an opportunity to create a website and so that all the businesses would have the opportunity to be part of it. So it's taken quite a long time to get through all these different hoops and, and, and how we go about setting it up, but we're at a really good point where the site it's just about finished being built and it's already paid for by the grant from the Southampton Fest. So now what we're looking for, what they are actually requesting is, can the village help us maintain it and run it? Because what really they want to do is, is they want to get every business that they can in the village, every business that's a member of the village will be able to be on this website. And there's also going to be different ways that it can be done. So, Obviously that costs money and to get it a maintenance fee and, and an enhancement program and how everything can be, you know, going through the hoops of social media. They've really sat down, they've chewed on everything, met with a designer, talked to them and, and they've really worked hard. They have some really good ideas and especially being in the environment that we are now with, with the COVID and how it's shut down people for, you know, eight weeks, nine weeks, and it's probably going to be close to 10 to 11 before they actually are going to be reopened they are really looking and we are really looking as a village to, to, to help each other out in any way we can. And so the new grant writer, Nicole Christensen, jumped right in, uh, applied for a grant for exactly uh, a type of program like this. Um, I know Russell, you have the CB, the, the community uh, grant also. So you know what, they're looking for a little bit of help and we, we really do believe that these grants are going to come through and, and if, the, if the board can, you know, you know, think about this and, and, and start really focusing our designs on when we reopen that we are going to be able to have a site where, where business is going to be able to be, you know, put up front. Uh, people can go on it, see what they're doing. They can actually relay how they're going to be running their businesses differently, the practices they're doing, how they're going to do it. I think it's, it's a great way to, sit, to, to, to bring everything together and start uh, really reopening. Excellent. Um, are there any other uh, comments from the board? Is this in conjunction or in addition to or chamber, you know, efforts, Mark, or uh, any discussion about that? Because I know no, the chamber, the there's a few chamber members that are on the board, but this is, this is a, a strictly a village owned website. So, mm -hmm. all right. There are a few businesses that are uh, in the chamber, but that are in the village. So this is strictly for, Village. The site will be called visit org, I believe is what we're going to call it, which now coincides with a lot of the social media network that two of the membership committees have done, and they've done a great job. They've grown followers. They're posting constantly about updates about what's going on through this whole pandemic, as well as what the businesses are doing. And you know what? This is what we need now. We need information going out to people to say, this is how my business is operating. If you want to get something, you can email us. We can have someone that can deliver it to you. So right now we know businesses are really looking, how can they do business in a totally different environment they've never had to think about doing it before? And how good can we do it? Because that's going to really be a make or break at some point for these businesses in the next, you know, within the next six months. Okay. 
And they are, listen, at the end of the day, it is our anchor of our village, a small business, yeah. as we're learning through this whole country yeah. right now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They're yeah. not giving yeah. loans out because we're not important. And, and Rich, that's a very good question. The Chamber is a member organization, but it's a critical strategic alliance to the village, as are our arts, arts organizations. I really appreciate our mayor indicating that we're supportive of it, but really we have no one-stop shop to showcase all of our retailers, all of our village assets, all of our wonderful uh, arts organizations, and this will do it with some beautiful photography from local uh, artists. So. Great. We're very excited. A lot of people have worked very, very hard uh, over a year before this, this group was even formed, but uh, a lot of great, great thoughts and passion and heavy lifting in, on this group. Thank you very much, uh, Trustee Allen. And uh, I just wanted to also thank the, uh, the Board of Trustees uh, for um, for approving um, uh, my, you know, my appointment of, of Nicole Christian. I think it's great that she's here. She was able to help us with this and just wanted to thank everyone for, for your votes uh, to, uh, to approve her. Um, and so there's definitely some other people I think that would also help us and would appreciate your votes there too. But thank you so much for uh, the vote for Nicole. I really appreciate it. Um, so um, I think with that being said, uh, we can move to suggested resolutions, uh, Russell, I'll, uh, let you take this one. Entertain a motion resolved that the reading of the minutes for the public session of April 21st, 2020 and the special meeting of April 29th, 2020 be dispensed with and that those minutes be accepted as filed by the village administrator and that the actions taken at that meeting be and hereby are ratified and approved. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Entertain a motion resolved that the claims for the warrant stated May 14th, 2020, totaling $232,037.07, warrant number 15 of the general fund, and $50,806.92, warrant number 12 of the capital reserve, and the village payrolls for the period from April 10th, 2020 to May 7th, 2020, be ordered and approved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, just a couple of things uh, really quickly. The $50,000 in the capital reserve was for the uh, HVA, HVAC system. Um, I'm sorry. And then uh, real quick, the dental and vision, uh, year-end uh, medical reimbursements for our volunteers uh, and coastal fire, uh, which is, was a large bill, was replacing lifeline rope systems for, uh, per NFPA and a bailout instructor class. Those are most of the, the larger bills. Um, and for uh, folks uh, who are watching or watch it on tape, uh, the warrant is posted on our website. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, entertain a motion resolved that the Board of Trustees accepts the donation of 3,000 three-ply masks from Hamptons Health Society, Inc. So moved. A second question on that is it three thousand? I thought it was five thousand. <laughs> um, I'm I apologize. Um, I, I was writing three ply and wrote three thousand. So, um, <laughs> and I thank think you, that, Dr. Michalos, right. for donating that to me on the behalf of the village. Thank you. Okay, accepted as a Scrivener's uh, counselor. Yes, okay. Um, so all in favor, aye. 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 Okay. Entertain a motion resolved that the Board of Trustees authorizes the budget transfer drainage on Pulaski Street and Pel Pelotro Street, moving uh, $40,000 into street maintenance contractual from street maintenance, supply, and maintenance. So moved. There a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, where is the recommendation of the Ethics Committee to add certain language to the Village of Southampton Annual Statements Financial Disclosure? Um, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees hereby amends the annual statements of, uh, of financial disclosure form to add the language um, as described uh, on the resolution. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, 
Mayor, Mayor Warren is, was, is making a motion uh, that be it resolved upon the recommendation of Chief Cummings that the Board of Trustees authorizes the hiring of the following part-time seasonal employees effective May 15th, 2020. So moved. Second. Can I make the motion first or do you need to make the yep. motion for me, Russell? You need, you need to make the motion. Okay, motion. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Ask the mayor to make a motion resolved that upon recommendation of the village administrator and the village tax receiver that the Board of Trustees authorizes the hiring of Emily Beers as a seasonal clerk for the tax receiver and an hourly rate of $17, effective May 15th, 2020. Motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ask the mayor to make a motion resolved upon the recommendation of the village administrator that that the Board of Trustees approves the hiring of Matthew Weeks as beach manager for the 2020 season, uh, May 23rd through September 7th at a salary of $21,000. Motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ask the mayor to make a motion, be it resolved that the, upon the recommendation of the village administrator that the Board of Trustees authorizes the hiring of the following part-time seasonal employees effective May 23rd, 2020. Motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any? Um, I'm recusing. I'm recusing myself for the uh, staff hires of the beach. I'm, I'm recusing myself from the beach <laughs> as well. Vote. Do you guys know anyone on that list? <laughs> well, no, but, well, I know everybody on the list, <laughs> honestly, but, I, but I know one particular person uh, a little better than the rest. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're excellent. They're excellent. And we were happy to have them. Yeah. Okay. Great. Mine's in the military. He's not on the list. And the other one's flying around. <laughs> well, as long as, the, as long as the remaining three uh, board members are okay with it. I counted three. I... Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, whereas that I've no one to put up. So. <laughs> whereas, yeah. whereas resolution number two of the board of trustees special meeting authorized the mayor to enter into agreement with Verizon Wireless. Uh, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Trustees that the project is hereby declared as a type two action under SECRA and that this resolution shall take effect immediately. The project being the wireless communication installation. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Whereas the Board of Trustees is desirous of replacing traffic control devices at the intersection of Main Street, Meeting House Lane, and Jobs Lane in accordance with the brief description of proposed action set forth in the short environmental assessment form. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees, uh, by the Board of Trustees, that the project is hereby declared a type two action under SECRA and that this resolution take effect immediately. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Whereas in connection with the priority projects identified by the harmful alg algal bloom HAB action plan that are being undertaken in partnership with the town trustees, the D New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, sorry about the dog, um, and the nonprofit Lake Aguam Conservancy. Um, now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Trustees that the Village Board of Trustees hereby supports the phased approach to conducting characterization assessments for the feasibility of a permanent reactive barrier and authorizes the mayor to sign any necessary agreements related to park access for this purpose and that the Village Board of Trustees hereby endorses Lake Aguam Conservancy's grant application to the Town of Southampton CPF Water Quality Improvement Plan to obtain additional funding for subsequent phases and that as recommended by Dr. Christopher Goldberg with, and consistent with the HABS action plan, the Village Board of Trustees hereby endorses the use of electronic device with an adjunct application of hydrogen peroxide pursuant to the necessary permitting and specifications of the New York State DEC in order to lessen the severity and duration of harmful algae blooms and that the above activity be considered a type two action pursuant to the provisions of title six New York State CR part 1627 and that this resolution take effect immediately. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Entertain a motion resolved that the Board of Trustees hereby authorizes the mayor to sign a three year license agreement with Pedal Share Inc. Discussion. So moved. Yeah. Have it moved and second. Moved. So moved. Second. 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 Discussion. Uh, just a quick discussion. We usually do a two year, not a three year, right? With most of our vendors. I just wanted to throw that out there. Not that I mean, have no issue with it, it's just we typically don't do three. That's all. 
So the, uh, the, the, the license was proposed. It's, it's totally up to the board as to how, what, whatever length they want to pick. Okay. I mean, they're a great group, mm. but we don't do our vendors at three typically. That's all. I'm comfortable with two if we want to start with two or if we, uh, if we want to have an option on our end for a third, we can, we can do an option. Do it. Let's check. Let, uh, if, uh, if the board feels inclined, we'll modify the license agreement to a two-year approval tonight. I'm comfortable. What's the, what's the resistance for a three since they've been established here? And um, was this, is there something that it's just curious? We've always had two year contracts or less. I don't know any vendors, whether it be, you know, they have a great track record. So have our attorneys in the past. So have our, but we're not even thinking about longer term contracts now with our concession. We're thinking about two years, right? So Can we've I, never um, gone beyond two years and, you know. Yeah, no, no, that's an interesting point. Uh, uh, Trustee Allen brings up um, Russell and or counselor um, clearly, their uh, pedal share was in agreements or entering agreements and, and, and putting out RFPs for neighboring municipalities. Is this pretty much in line of what they're asking for or doing with their other municipalities? Is, is that where the three year comes from? No, I just think it was a preference, perhaps given its track record, having already been here. But, um, you I mean, know, again, I don't, I don't personally have a problem with it, but, you know, Trustee Allen brings up a good point, but I, 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 I'm ambivalent, uh, quite honestly. It's the board's uh, discretion. I'm just raising something no, I, I've seen in my past two, almost three years. So I'm throwing it out there and I have no issues. Like I said, they're great guys. They have a good track record. I appreciate that point because I did not know that generally it's two, it's two year contracts being new to the game. So, but um, we can say, Hey, look, do you, do you have any uh, preference uh, you can opine on uh, about this um, counselor? <clears throat> <laughs> you did caught, right caught me mid cough there uh, uh which was right. a bad joke during the pandemic right no uh, uh no no it really it's uh it really is it, it subsequently makes no difference the only it's really the board's the board's discretion and feeling as to whether they want to award a two-year or a three-year the only thing i'll add is that if you know again if if this expands and they're very successful um you know obviously this year will be a year that's hard to to kind of monitor how well they did uh, right. next year would probably be the you know kind of a, a bellwether as to how they're doing um we might want to come doing? back and we might want to come back and say how about a little you know a little share of of what you're doing so i mean that could be the only reason i could see going two years i did bring that up in the negotiations when i spoke with them um you know they said that uh you know they you know they they do okay um uh i do think that uh you know, we could take a good look at it and say, hey, um, your benefit from using, you know, our, our village, uh, you know, maybe you could share a little of the, of the, of the, of the income with us. So that's the, that's the only thing from a, you know, from an administrative part I could add. But we have that ability to revisit that. Is that what you're saying? I said, if we do two I, years, I if we do, if we do two years, then we could certainly have that part of the conversation if, if we, you know, when, when the renewal comes up. Okay. So if someone wants to make a motion to amend the resolution to two years, um, I would, could entertain that motion. And a two year being what, 2020 current? Is, is, there, is this back you know, a lot? Because I know this has been discussion for a while and we've been in. Uh, That's 2020, 2021. Uh, Trustee, you want to make that motion? No, I think Trustee, I think all of you have said they have a good track record. So I'm fine with the three years. Okay. Everybody else fine with Thank three years? You for letting me raise it. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, entertain a motion resolved that the Board of Trustees hereby authorizes the mayor to sign a letter committing the village to continue participation in the Suffolk County multi jurisdictional monthly multi hazard mitigation plan. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We have some add-ons, um, and I'm going to ask the uh, council to assist if uh, if I go off track here. Resolved that the Board of Trustees hereby adopts changes to the beach permit regulations as outlined 
um, in a memo uh, in the memo dated, uh, dated Thursday, May 14th, uh, from Trustee Andrew Pallaro. Um, do I need to maybe go through any of that or no? Okay, so moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, Unless uh, you want me to second my own memo. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Um, I just I would like to add I would like to add to the resolution. Oh, we need to add, yeah, the the no taking effective, of right effective, um, uh, effective Friday, uh, May twenty second. And also, Russell, you wanted to add that there will be no uh, sale of permits for the fire or school district at the uh, no sales at the beach. No sales at the beach. Okay. Yes. Okay. So with those with those two, um, all in favor. Aye. Aye. And just so everyone knows, I, um, I will get to Julie um, first thing in the morning. Uh, the specifics of this uh, will get it posted in, and, and out to uh, the public uh, immediately um, so, that, uh, so that the public's aware of what we're doing. Um, okay, uh, entertain a motion resolved at the Board of Trustees authorizes movie night at Cooper's Beach on May 23rd and 24th for the Southampton Arts Center and that the Board of Trustees hereby waives any and all fees that uh, would be charged by the village. So is there a second? So I have, second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Russell, please up for a second. Was there was there also a resolution that was necessary on the farmers market? Did they need something from us? No. If you if if you uh, recall, they were they were approved pending the pandemic. So we decided that was an administrative um, action to tell them that, that that it's okay for them to move forward. Perfect. And then um, entertain a motion that the village administrator publish and post a notice of public hearing. Uh, to repeal local law number one of 2020 to repeal the tax cap override to be held on Tuesday, May 26, 2020 at 6 p.m. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in second. favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Those are the proposed resolutions. Thank you very much, Russell. Very good uh, uh, resolutions this evening. Um, one quick question for you before we go to comments from board members. Uh, in the uh, the memo that we just uh, uh, resolved and adopted, we discussed uh, buses. Was that in that memo, or is that is that a, is that phase two? That was in that memo, uh, Mayor. In discussion. Hold on one sec. Bear with me. If not, I think it'd be nice to put that in. But if not, you no, know. No, I think you are. Yeah. Discussion. It's in discussion points. Discussions. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I brought no up about the tour there. buses. The tour yeah. buses, really, not not the shuttles. Yeah. The tour buses. I, I, I think that's a good a good pickup. We can or, move that. We can sir. I can certainly move that out of discussion and up until mm -hmm. up until point nine of Cooper's, okay. um, so that we can have you know no no tour buses, drops off at least until until June twenty sixth. Okay. Excellent. Good pickup. Thank you. Thank you. So, do we want to um, recall an amend? Yeah, uh, let's just do an amendment to that resolution to add, if, if I may, and I'll, yes, I'll go ahead, Trustee Pillow, in, in your words, um, to add discussion point seventeen with regard to the drop off of buses into memo point nine on that resolution. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor. All right. Aye. 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 All right. Good work, everyone. Thank you to the, the whole team here. Um, we now move to uh, comments uh, from board members. So uh, Trustee Yastrzemski, uh, as usual. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all. Um, and again, just the usual shout out to everyone who is out there on the front line, certainly our first responders uh, on a daily basis and, and healthcare workers and our, uh, everybody in the store who's deemed essential. Um, you know, our, our calls that we are many, all of us are in many different and a lot of the same and some different calls. Uh, there seems to be a light at the end of the tunnel as far as, uh, you know, directives from the state coming down to us, um, you know, of how we can loosen things up and, and enter, re-enter society in a safe way. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate everybody's patience. 
uh, the citizens' patience to, to as, as we, as a governing body, implement all these things. You know, uh, you know it's all about proper implementation and enforcement, um, which kind of leads me to a little a point here that I wanted to bring up. Um, this point has been brought up by people uh, a lot as of late, um, certainly during this, during this, this crisis, um, and it's been brought up in the past, uh, but certainly um, a little more now. And it is, um, I guess, to simply put, you know, a bicycle safety. Uh, you know, that we have uh, competition, if you will, on, on the roadways here as it's gotten warmer and people can't go to gyms. So it's, it's a beautiful thing that people are out exercising and um, exercising their right to go out and, and exercise and, and get the physical activity. It's what we have, it's what we're known for. Um, but there seems to be uh, at some point a competition between uh, pedestrians and bicycles on the roadways with vehicles. And, um, and again, not to begrudge people who want to go out and use the roadway to, again, to, to bicycle and walk and so forth. Um, I do think this crisis has kind of skewed a few things about what people think is right and wrong, uh, what they're allowed to do and what not allowed to do. And, and I'll just quote very simply um, the law. Uh, you know, vehicle and traffic law from the state. And when it pertains to bicycle safety, um, I'll just read very simply, uh, most rules of the road, uh, the rules of the road that apply to a motor vehicle also apply to a bicycle. Always ride on the right side of the road with the flow of traffic and ride on the shoulder of the road or in a designated bicycle lane. Now, the reason I bring that up specifically is we've all seen it. And I've had many discussions with many different people about, um, about this and, and, and speeding cars and cars and traffic. At the end of the day, people do need to realize the roadway is for primarily vehicular traffic. Um, and that rules of the road do have to be, uh, even in times of crisis, uh, do have to be uh, abided by. And uh, I've actually seen, witnessed personally, bicyclists, walkers actually kind of challenge, if you will, uh, vehicles uh, to prove, almost play chicken, if you will, which I don't recommend is a good thing, uh, a bicyclist or a pedestrian you know, playing chicken with a 5,000, 4,000 pound vehicle. Um, but I've, I just want to remind people as it's even getting warmer, um, rules of the road still apply in executive orders. And you're not supposed to be riding bicycles in tan, uh, in side by side. Uh, if, it, if space allows, by all means. Um, but even you're really not supposed to be. You're supposed to ride on the side of the road on the shoulder in tandem. And um, especially when vehicles are coming, uh, people should not be forcing vehicles to go around them. Uh, if you're actually forcing them to cross the WL, you're actually forcing the vehicle to do something that they're not supposed to do. So I just want to remind people in a very polite way, um, while they're exercising certain abilities and what they think is their right, um, they're actually in violation uh, when it comes to not exercising proper um, road etiquette. And again, we all are here to share the roads. And I know we've, we've had a lot of discussion about this and, and I continue it, uh, expect it to continue, but I just want to remind people again, uh, always be safe. Um, and, and my mantra through this whole thing is, you know, know the law and know your rights. Um, and and um, please people go out there and be careful on the roadway because it's, it's going to get more hectic. So that's really what I wanted just to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the good thoughts there. Uh, next is uh, Trustee Allen. Thank you, Mayor. Again, I hope everyone is healthy and safe and I'm glad you tuned in tonight. Uh, I wanted to just say that with COVID, it's eclipsed some of the good work that is being done by many people in the village. I wanted to talk about the environment and I'm pleased to report that the Community Preservation Fund closed on three acres of property on Lake Agawam in the past couple of months. It was actually great timing as it was a $10 million purchase. And we're very fortunate. It was a long haul. It's three acres, you know, never to be built on. We'll never create any septic runoff. And uh, a big shout out and thank you to the CPF advisory board led, led by Lisa Combrink now, and the town council, Jane, Jay Schneiderman and Christine Scalera and Tommy John and John Bouvier and Julie Lof, Lof, Lofstad who voted for it at that time a year and a half ago, and all the people who helped advocate to bring the, you know, 
for us to get that very generous contribution from the CPF fund. So uh, the reason why that 10 million is material is we're obviously in a very different world today than we were a mere three to four months ago. And our April Suffolk County tax revenues fell 27%. So nobody was really shopping, nobody was really driving, and there's no sales tax on groceries. So, you know, that's, that's X thousands of dollars less a month that we're going to get as a village. So um, obviously we have the CARES Act money coming and I know uh, we're going to rally as a village. <laughs> I'm gonna look at the mayor to, to rally for us to get as much money as we can. But, um, you know, we have to watch our pennies so we were lucky to get that. And I think we're very happy that we have two village water priorities that have now been approved. You know, the, I don't want to, again, steal the thunder from the mayor, but the sewage district and watershed study that we approved a month ago, and now, you know, what we approved today. So anyway, uh, the few other things I wanted to talk about is the, the cell coverage and broadband. I really have said this a lot. I think it's a game changer. And with telecommuting and telehealth and distance learning and people wanting to reach out um, and as Trustee Parrish and Pilaro mentioned, touchless touch on the beaches. Uh, I think it's very good that we're having preliminary conversations. Uh, Trustee Pilaro and I with Altice, who owns Optimum Online and with Verizon Fios. I thank the guys for coming tonight. It's one nice step in the right direction from a health and safety issue, but now we need all of this to rebuild our community and we cannot be you know, picking up pieces. We need to get out of the gate pretty quickly on it. And um, I'm going to hand off the business revitalization committee topics to Trustee Parrish, um, but I just wanted to thank everybody who has been working on that group. Uh, but my last comment is that this village has demonstrated tremendous acts of kindness that have just made me have just the most incredible trust and appreciation for humanity. When I see all the first responders, when I see Hamptons Health United with, you know, donating masks and respirators and um, the, board, the Operations International giving all their flowers and the rotary and then tonight the, the scores of people standing in line at the Southampton Fire Department giving blood. I just say we are a community like no other. And thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Allen. Uh, next is uh, Trustee Parrish. Yes, and this to follow suit with some thank yous. Um, yeah, what can we really say about what's going on? Um, this village has stepped up. Uh, it really has. Some of the things that have gone on in this village over the last eight weeks going into nine has been very impressive. And there's people on this board and out in the public have really been involved in it. And as far as our staffing, our employees, our residents, everybody has stepped up and rose to the occasion. And we are in, we are very fortunate enough to uh, have uh, very low rates of COVID out here. And that's a lot to do with a lot of things that have been implemented. So I wanna just really make sure that that is really, really, really important to pass along. And you know, more importantly, I was reading something this week on, on, on model thinking. Um, and I came across something that I just wanted to share. It's gonna make it very quick. Um, you know, comfort zones, our comfort zones have been challenged. You know, we are so used to doing some things that we don't do and now we can't. We're yearning for all sorts of things to reach for and grab onto that make us feel like we're, we're engaged again and attached. And, you know, a lot of things that we're talking about are, are gonna try and give us a sense of that again with drive-in movies, with the farmer's market, with the Memorial Day, uh, you know, veterans, um, you know, ceremony. And, you know, the one thing that we have expectations of the world, but we now realize those have changed. So one of the things I came across that I thought was really interesting is like the element of surprise, what surprise is. You know, surprise is telling us now that it's an opportunity for learning. And I think that we're seeing here tonight, we got on a lot of discussions is we're all learning how to move through this. And it's great to see that something that has been put in our laps across the whole village, towns, county, states, country, world. We are all learning from this. And we are doing pretty darn good right now for something that we've never had to deal with before. So I want to say thank you to everybody in front of me on this uh, Zoom and the people out there that are going to see this. 
we appreciate everybody's element of surprise and learning how to get through this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Parrish. Uh, Trustee Pilaro. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I mean, I echo what everyone said about the, our village. Um, I echo uh, about being safe on the roads. Um, I echo that, uh, you know, that our first responders and, and doctors and nurses and everyone has really stepped up in a, in a, in a time of crisis um, where we don't know what's next. We don't know what's around the corner. Um, we know that we're starting to flatten the curve. We know that we have, you know, a few of the matrix um, left to go before, before Long Island can consider kind of re-engaging, reopening. Um, but that will bring uh, many, many other challenges um, to, you know, to the residents of the village um, as people start to get back to work. Um, as, as things start to improve, as, as you know, people really are able to get back and hopefully earn some money so that they can put food on their table uh, and, and take care of their families. Um, so I ask for patience, I ask for continued patience um, from everyone uh, because there will be new challenges ahead uh, that, that we have yet to decide. You know, as, as I said earlier, who would have thought we may have been talking about um, reservation, res Reservation systems for Southampton beaches. Um, I certainly wouldn't have, wouldn't have thought it, but here we are. We, we're, we're in a new era. Um, we have to new, learn new things. We've had to learn how to work from home. We've had to learn how to uh, be educated in home and to become teachers to our children. Um, and, uh, and I am happy that you know, it can be done with kindness. And I hope that kindness will continue um, for everyone out there. Uh, not just yourself, not just your family, but but anyone and everyone that you that you come across, um, because as as I think and I and I've said this before, you never know what the the story is of the other person, um, but if you lead with kindness, kindness will follow in return. Um, so that that really is uh, is is where I I come come to end this. And and again, we have done a lot of a lot of wonderful things. I think we will continue to do a lot more in the challenges that come and we will meet them, we will meet them all head on. Um, so thank you uh, to the public um, for tuning in, watching. Thank you to those who will be watching um, when this comes out on the link and on our website. And um, please everyone stay safe, wash your hands. Thank you, that's right, Trustee Pilaro. Um, so thank you very much. Um, uh, I echo uh, those thoughts and I just wanted to sum up Good meeting tonight. Really, really good meeting. Um, everyone uh, stepped up here. Uh, we did a great job. Uh, thank you uh, to uh, Trustee Pilaro, um, especially in Trustee Parrish as well on the um, on our beach plan. Uh, thank you, uh, Trustee Allen, uh, for your insightful questions on the uh, on our Verizon presentation, and uh, and and Trustee Yastrzemski, thank you for your steady hand in this. So I just wanted to wrap up, and I think this was really. Uh, you know, one of our uh, strongest uh, meetings we've had. So um, I, of course, you know, echo uh, all of our trustees' thoughts on the incredible acts of kindness. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, point out to those listening, um, all of our trustees, all of our board have heard this repeatedly on our county calls, but we are almost there. Uh, we have hit five out of the seven metrics uh, with the two metrics that we haven't hit, which are uh, death, uh, death rates and uh, new hospitalizations. Uh, but the good news is new hospitalizations, which is the biggest trouble metric we've actually started to hit. Um, we are grouped in with all of Long Island. Um, and so while we are likely in better shape on the East End, um, we are, as they say, it's not a cliche, we're in this together, but we are getting there. Um, and so um, I think we're all gonna be pretty relieved and happy when that day comes, um, when the governor um, uh, lifts uh, or reopens uh, Long Island as he's done, uh, as he will do tomorrow, for three regions in upstate New York. So we're all very excited about that. I think the next thing our board will work on together is a guidance you know, to our businesses and hopefully uh, you know, Trustee Allen and, and Trustee Parrish, you could help us with the Business Revitalization Committee. I think one of the, uh, the, the, the things we should continue to work on, I know we're already working on it, is, is the guidance. And then we could kind of give our own you know, micro and local guidance to our businesses here. So I wanted to, um, to thank you for that. 
And then, um, Trustee Ann, I think maybe you could help with another project as well. I know you've been very much, um, you know, working with, uh, you know, updating Wi-Fi, but uh, Russell and I have been speaking or, you know, to be out, reaching out to Optimum and Altice about uh, in-home, uh, you know, service here. Um, there's a lot of people here more than usual. And so a uh, conversation reaching out to, uh, to Optimum could be very helpful. Russell's got a great contact there and we'd love to just get some dialogue with them to find out exactly what's going on and what, what there's anything we can do to help improve the, uh, the Wi-Fi service out here in people's homes. So if you don't mind taking the, uh, the lead on that, that'd be very helpful. Um, I have an update and yes, absolutely. We've already spoken, thank you. Excellent. Um, and uh, I also wanted to point out, uh, this is not related to COVID-19, but it's been a work in progress. Our resolutions tonight were really sharp. I mean, we had very detailed resolutions. We'll notice from the size of the agenda, it's a bit longer than usual but that's because um, our resolutions were really strong and detailed and, and exactly what we need for specifics. So I wanted to thank our village attorney, Brian Egan, but I also wanted to especially thank uh, assistant village attorney, uh, Alexandra Halsey-Storch. Um, when she was first uh, appointed, uh, this was one of her projects that she worked on to make sure that our resolutions were very detailed um, so that we knew exactly what we were adopting um, and there was no gray area and so I just wanted to point that out that our resolutions were, were really strong tonight and they continue to get better. Um, and I think as a board, uh, we've done a really good job uh, making sure that uh, we're improving our, our resolutions. And so when you look at the minutes 10 years from now, you'll hopefully see in the end of 2019 and 2020 that this board helped, uh, helped turn around really the, uh, the resolutions and make them super specific and, and to benefit the village. So thank you for all there. Um, and uh, with that said, again, I echo our board. So thank you very much. Uh, to our employees, to our board, uh, to everyone here. So uh, I'd like to now, if it's, uh, I'd like to make a motion uh, to adjourn the meeting. So hopefully we've got a second and, and good work, everyone. So second. 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 All in favor. Aye. Aye. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank good night, you. all.